won't be nasty to anyone. And uh, you get roughly about five minutes. There's no um, time on it. And there's no special uh, guest or anything tonight. It's back to the original open mica. And we'll get a kickoff um, with uh, wonderful Christine Fowler. Hi. This um, first one comes with a little bit of a trigger warning um, because it is a little bit sad. It's called A Precious Child. The story behind this is this actually happened. A precious child lying in the hospital bed, hardly breathing, being kept alive by inflicting pain to shock a system to start again. What led to this awful plight? A visit to a friend where everything should have been all right? Instead, their relative and addict had left strong drugs in wrappers shiny and bright. For little fingers at just the right height. Three sweets later, she's lying unconscious on the floor, her blood pressure plunged and oxygen levels far too low. Her mother feared that she was dead, her head was filled with the most awful dread. A ride in the ambulance with sirens ringing straight to intensive care, her mother seeing the grave faces there. The medical team working flat out could give no reassurances that everything would be all right. Would head or heart or kidneys or all be damaged beyond repair? As her parents sat up all night in anguish and in fear, their hearts breaking at the sound of what they might hear. At last she gained brief consciousness but could not speak until long hours later. Still stoned, she ate and ate as the drug effect at last began to abate. The heart and kidneys seem okay but still they wait and wait as she distracted, not quite sad self. So hoping to be told all is really well again they wait and wait. Then at last homeward bound, no lasting harm has been found, but she remembers and blames herself for eating sweeties not given by mum, even when your friend is there and you're told that you can share. That lesson learnt at the age of four, to almost die to learn to do what told by mum. And never ever in a place where innocent little fingers can be tempted by wrappers bright to eat chocolate covered sweets as an unexpected treat. <coughs> At the time it turned out all right, except for the people whose house it was. So never take for granted your child's life. It was as fragile as the breeze and can be in a single moment gone. That's the first one. The second one uh, came out reading an article about cliff erosion and about how people lose their houses because the cliff just takes them away with them. So it's just called erosion. Perched on faltering footings, leaning perilously over the foaming waves below, its dead-eyed windows broken, creaked and groaned as the wind blew in heaving gusts, loosening bricks as crumbling stone peeled away, forsaken cliffs, the encroaching sea smashed and foamed, lashing until in one final moment the perchant house shook and cracked, slabs of no longer knitted bricks in heavy lurches judder free, only to sink beneath the waves below, pulling the next one in the terraced queue as tiptoeing it took its place, eradicating signs of past lives once lived. Now only the disquiet echoes of children's voices pierced the wind, heard only by the sea girls soaring overhead as the heightening waves rose in vertiginous falls 
piled in swish and salty scum filled swamp and swirls, gushing endlessly, headlong, beneath the trembling, tiptoeing one's whole house and home. The second one. Um, the third one, I really like some of the Taylor Coleridge um, programme about Kubla Khan. And this was my attempt to do another fragment, <laughs> um, but a bit more update um, a few years ago anyway. So it's very short. If, and um, when I talk about knights, it's knights with a K, as in armoured knights from med med uh, medieval time. A frost and light defines a vision of cloud-lit spies and spires fragile stretching in iconic array. Define logic and call derision as plot and planners spout and babble in officers dull and grey. Beneath them crying voices linger and traffic noises blare and shout. A sore buskin singer sucks in air and shapes his mouth. Flickering neons chastise the eye and speak of dreams so brief and bright. Whilst the homeless drift and sometimes lie in crumpled heaps like fallen nights. Do we have time for one more, um, Finn? Yeah. Yeah, of course, of course. Uh, do you want a sad one or do you want a, a, a nature one? I Sad one. I always like sad ones. Okay. <laughs> this one's called Stillbirth. And again, this uh, happened to someone I, I, I know. Hot tears ran down my cheeks. Filled with anguish and with pain, my hopes shattered. Only greyness now remained. The love I carried inside had died before he saw the light of day. My baby, stillborn in my arms, limp he lay. My tears flowed, they could not water him back to life, and like a plant, he could not revive. I held him close and kissed his brow and wished and wished that this was not how his birth had been. My son had taken my heart away, and with it all my imagined future days. I would never see him grow tall, or play with friends, or wipe his bloodied knees, or hug him tight, or tell him stories in bed at night. I'd never see him go to school, play football, swim, or ride a bike. All I would have would be packed in a box, a name band a booty and one photograph. Thank you. Thank you. Well, when you said sad, that was sad. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Christine. Always a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're moving on now and we're going to um, somewhere we've never been before. We're going to Cyprus. Would you please welcome Manuela Mavro Michalis? Hope I got that right. <laughs> you pronounced that perfectly, Finn. Thank you. <laughs> That's a first. <laughs> um, I'd like to do two point poems, if that's all right. The first one is called Migratory Birds, and um, I have an interest in displacement and migration, um, being um, half Greek, half Cypriot, born in London and raised throughout the Middle East. and in the United States. Um, so it's um, I'm constantly talk, thinking about belonging and identity. There are fragments of my soul, scattered bird seed across continents, field, moor, desert, sea, marsh, plain, wetland, mountain, each one claiming citizenship and inalienable very inalienable rights of belonging. My soul's hips twist, undulate to each call. Ade, yalla, hade, ela, kanta, ali, liora, gorumu, ela, saban, goritsimu. 
my larynx reverberates, hoarse from responding to each summoning. My ribs have become brittle, constricting and expanding. They rattle a cage of defense for the vascular organ within, pumping memories of wing, feather, breast, tail, claw, eye, beak, crown. A hymn of sweet melancholy. I belong nowhere holy. Where I go, an absent sliver of me remains, a seed, grain, spark, cell, kernel, particle, dash, morsel of meanness, missing. I am the flamingo migrating from the Salt Lake at Hala Sultan Peke in Lavnaga to the oasis in the scrubland of Bahrain. Bahrain, two seeds. Iki Denise, the Othalasse, sweet and salty, like me. A falcon cresting a khanjar in Oman amidst sacks of frankincense, tobacco and oud. A pigeon defecating on the statue of Admiral Nelson in Trafalgar Square, loving, despising the colonizer. A little owl between the fallen columns at Delphi, Baalbek and the temple of Ira in Samos. Silver wings against blood moon, guide on dark soul nights. I weave between palm fronds, scatter blossoms from bergamot trees, pluck jasmine and plum grapes from vines, rose petals and rice beneath my feet, si sipping sweet fragrant wine, saffron tea and coffee infused with cardamom. My soul is scattered in a thousand pieces, and I am a strange bird made up of peacock plumes, pigeon, ostrich, bulbul, jigla, kelibonagi, quail, and goose. I have no Latin name to legitimize me, define my species and genus, but I am not alone. There are many strange birds migrating, collecting seeds of their scattered souls across forest, glacier, valley, brook, stream, tundra, hill, savanna. And we recognize each other. Am I um, allowed to be explicit? It's pretty much compulsory sometimes, I think, yes. <laughs> All right, so another thing that I'm very interested in is connection and how does one connect with other people? Um, and it always comes down to allowing yourself to be vulnerable. So um, I've been kind of thinking about um, the things that make you real, feel vulnerable. And um, I was like, oh, dating makes you feel vulnerable, being married with kids and all these different things. So I'm writing a series of poems. This is the first one, the things that make you feel vulnerable, the dating edition. It's making love without the aid of ambient lighting, cellulite, stretch marks, every dimple, every extra slice of red velvet cake on show. And when he says, mm, baby, I want to see all of you. You know he's lying and you shock yourself because just for a fleeting second, you consider sticking his head into your ample bosom and suffocating the bastard because who the hell fucks without having the decency to dim the lights? It's saying, I love you first. And sitting through the silence that follows, knowing you said it too soon or maybe you shouldn't have said it at all. Maybe you're just unlovable shit. Tinder sucks, and you are an idiot for wanting more than a quick shag from the guy who said, and I quote, you can sit on my face and I'll eat my way to your heart. Just to be clear, it was the promise of heart, not the promise of oral that hooked me. It's strutting your way to the bar to get another glass of Pinot Grigio, fully aware that you are working it, girl. Men are eyeing your ass, and even some women are checking you out. So you give it an extra wide swing to compensate for the 1,000 squat challenge you've contemplated while dunking chocolate-covered biscuits in your tea but never got around to, only to get to the bathroom hours later and realize you have a big blotch of blood, like a red flag at a bull flight, all over the all over the seat of your jeans, and those looks were not <laughs> check you out looks, but definitely pity looks. What 
a bloody mess, literally. Vulnerable is saying sorry, sorry when you know you've messed up, but he's messed up too so many times and he never says sorry. So why should you? Although admittedly this time was a major clusterfuck on your part, but you're only human. Surely he gets that, and he knows you love him, doesn't he? I mean, you've told him at least a million times in a million different ways, but you know you've got to cut the bullshit out, swallow your pride and say it, even if the mistake was at least 50% his, or possibly 40%, definitely 10%. Regardless, it's the right thing to do. You know it, we all do, but doesn't love mean never? having to say you're sorry. Seriously, who makes up this fantastical drivel? That's probably the most abysmal piece of advice ever given, and I hope the creator never has the pleasure of experiencing wild, crazy, passionate, and albeit completely dysfunctional makeup sex. Of course you have to say sorry when you mess up, but it's so hard. I'm sorry, okay? No, that's not the way. Look him in the eye, <clears throat> take it slow, show him you mean it. I'm really sorry. I'm so sorry, my love. It's you, only you. I ever want to sit on and have you eat your way to my heart. Oh, thank you, man. What a way to enter a block that is. Thank you. That was stunningly great. Thank you. Thank you. Hope to get you back some back sometime. Thank you. Wow. Natalie, you have to follow that. <laughs> oh, God. I nearly jumped out of my skin then. Yes, all right. Uh, Manuela, welcome. That was fantastic. Thank you. I didn't, really can't follow that. I'm not going to pretend to be able to. So I'm just going to um, go ahead with what I had planned to read. So um, this one is about nostalgia called Kuda Shuda Wuda. That wish for what could have been tricks my hope to greener pastures. Nostalgia promises the world to me if I would pass back from the other side. Fickle dreams of what I should have seen on the inspiration in another time zone teases me at what might have been if I'd just stayed a little longer. We could have turned the lights down low, babe. We should have put a smooth record on. Stay, please. We would have danced to the slow, the sweetest tango I'd always hoped for when my feet touched the dance floor. The picnics I'd never had with my best friends in the sand, which never flew into my sandwich on the stretch of blind promises. The brisk morning walks along the beach I only ever, ever man managed once. Warm sun I dream of burnt the skin of my feet. Seizing the new day only ever happens in Never Never Land when my container of pixie stuff is still full, when the magic potion is overflowing, when my cylinders are all going. The fickle nature of memories past convince me to draw out my instincts of self. What truly happened just throws me off the scent of sentiments. The ghost of wistful past skips over indulgences point to present qualms and now I'm wallowing in a constant daze. Hedonistic regrets evoke rose-coloured spirit. The spirit of future romanticism is broken. Shudders as it hits the wall of humility and reality smacks me awake. I look back over my shoulder. Nostalgia winks cheekily, waving his sweet lies at So that was that one. And uh, I actually, I'm, I'm going to switch. I had one ready, but I, 
um, I wrote this the other day and yeah, speaking of vulnerabilities. Um, <clears throat> so if I can't, if I don't, if I read it a little odd, it's because my writing. It doesn't have a title yet. I don't care if the world's bare, if the floors cave in, if the wheels don't spin. I don't care if my ideas come loose, if the story doesn't spruce from my thought process. I don't care if the kids don't listen when I've got something to say about consequences. I don't care that you wasted three years to say what I needed to hear that my own self-doubt is not equal to the amount of the sum of my fear up until this point. I don't think doubt now as I read your mouth round, taste the sweet truth of your salt's lips. I can't remember body spasms in the very thought of your hand which melt my imaginary me for my imaginary you. Least you cast your mind back when you gave unto me the capacity to feel you breathe, except you wouldn't, I couldn't. I don't care that it was unfair as I still feel the breath we both took in as we stood so close, examining every nook and cranny of the scent of your neck, the stub of your nose, the rough of your beard. I so dearly want to scratch on my flesh. Our minds enveloping in lust of connection we find in every form of our, of our minds and delve up and I can't ask you to come back and you can't return to me anew, but I don't care because now I know you told me so. I'm going to leave it at that for this evening. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Wonderful stuff again. Reality smacks me awake. Yeah. <laughs> Get that feeling, I think. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thanks, Wonderful. Thanks. No problem. All right. We're moving on to, um, I say I know blotter, but I don't mean that like that. <laughs> Chris Beck. <laughs> thanks, Finn. <laughs> Hi everyone, nice to see you all again. Actually, old is, is okay because uh, two poems uh, tonight which are pretty reflective uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, I became 65 just a few weeks ago and that was a real shocker. 60 was okay. <laughs> 61, 62 I could cope with, but 65, man, that's not happy with that. And yeah, just, 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 a, yeah, ago, just a young in, Chris. Yeah, just a just young. A young <laughs> just a young, just a young. But um, also discovered uh, a few weeks ago that I'm going to be a grandfather, which is, is, is kind of nice. So two poems which are a bit, a bit reflective. When you come to tell my story, my son, to the wee boy on your knee, when I'm dead and you tell him my story, what will you say about me? Will I be a hero as my grandfather was? decorated by the king for his bravery. He fought for freedom and obscene war. But what will you say about me? Well, I bring adventure as my father did, driving steam trains from cities to sea, a strong, proud Scotsman with ready laugh. But what will you say about me? Well, I carve dreams as my granddad did, cutting the granite that built a city. A hard, tough man with a ready smile. But what will you say about me? Will you say I love? Will you say I laugh? Will you say I live with dignity when all is said and done to your young son sitting on your knee? What will you say about me? So that's the first one there. Thank you. And the second one is something I think as we all get older becomes just a little bit precious, I think. It's called silence. The older I get, the more I appreciate silence. 
when younger, younger and younger, I wanted people. I wanted highlights and peaks of sound. I wanted waterfalls of crashing laughter. I craved the cacophony of clamoring conversation with myself solely centered as prince of the party. Music played loudly loud, used to fill any grating gaps in the sound of Sounds. I love the song. It didn't relate though. Now silence is holy and holy to be cherished. On stage, I relish the moments of pause, the Pinterest poignancy of silence, saying more than any sound can manage. Now, at the age that I am, silence is precious. When I can sit and explore the inner landscapes of my mind, rambling in quietude and the calmness of silence. My love and I sit sometimes in silence, which still says, I love you. For to share a silence filled with promise is precious time well spent. My poetry brings silence and solace, silent solace to a sometimes troubled mind. And at the end, the final verse, looking to end my poem, my poem with a final stanza of silence. There we go. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. And you get a huge round of silent applause now. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm doing is perfect. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I do get that. Silence is great. I just they got me here in here, so I don't hear anybody, and that's fine. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks, Chris. Uh, all right. We're moving across uh, now to a different time zone and another debutante and another bunch of air miles collected on Lake of Blood. We've got Singapore. Would you please welcome Sylvia Angle King? Sylvia. I think she's muted. Unmute yourself. That's it. <laughs> Hello, everybody. This is Sylvia Ang from Singapore, Sylvia Ang Lee King. I'm going to read a poetry that I had did at the Singapore Poetry Writing Month in April called Singapore Rhyme More 21 Day 17. The unspoken word from write a poem about your hidden feeling for someone. And the title is called Secret of My Year. Sweet cherish, each time I walk past my doorway, I don't have the courage to call out to you. Is it me that you are looking for? Or have you found your girl or you are searching for someone? I am yearning for your touch. Your lip touches mine. We quiver and ask for more. Will you be mine? I can watch the, we can watch the sunset together. At times, we can ride the rainbow to catch the moon. I like you. You are a man of few words. You are cheerful, happy-go-lucky, and fun to be with. Why am I like this? Why am I hiding my feelings and thoughts for you for so long? I'm afraid I will lose you. I can't see you again. Sweet cherish, I'm taking the courage to put this point on your table. Will you be mine? Send me a rose with your name if you accept me as a girlfriend. 
Two days later, she received a rose and a card say it all. Thank you for your point. I like it. Will you be my girl? That's me at Andy's at East Point this Saturday, 6.30 p.m. Sweet Cherish. This is a piece of artwork. It's not a real story. Somebody asked me, how is your date? I say there is no date. So it's very funny. I'm doing the second piece. Yep. Please do. Okay. This second piece is written by my poetry bunny. Her name is Sunshine Grace Charming. And the title is Have You Told Her? Dashing tear of hate, asymmetrical cut of box star hair, silhouette, accentuating curly edges, eyes piercing the heart, cherishing, celebrating, and all, and one embracing and enraging with compassion and wisdom. A commentary writing a gay thing lingering yet you wonder where you have seen her. Have you heard her wit? Have you seen her will? Have she stricken you with her verb? Have you shaken? Has she shaken you with her affirmation? Everything she does, everything she expresses, do you ever get to know her? They say two is better than one, for one is for long, two is trouble, and more than two will get magical. Will you ever know her? Will you ever seen her? Will you tell her what you know now? Sylvia, a jewel to behold, will you? Finish. So I look forward to see you guys in the next uh, meeting again. Thank you, Sylvia. Thank you for uh, staying up, being up at this time of the morning with you, Makatu. Thank you very much and welcome. You're now officially a blotter. <laughs> okay. Uh, next up, we have... Um, it is sitting there, sitting down. A man will be helping me celebrate tonight over the years that uh, the SNP victory is up here in the elections. Again, you please welcome Xavier. Hello. Yes, uh, actually, hello, everybody. Actually, uh, yeah, um, I think the uh, repercussions of um, Catalan's independence, you know, um, have reached um, uh, have reached uh, Scotland, and I hope that soon the British state will be dissolved and, and finished for the goodness of humanity. Unfortunately, here in Wales, it hasn't gone as expected. But I do hope that um, the uh, separatists uh, will be breaking or will be re re reorganizing it in, in the next elections from Labour and, and, and other parties. But uh, let's go back to um, to poetry because at the end of the day, poetry uh, politics are very I, are very very boring and it's just a few guys, you know, filling their pockets on our hopes. So. Um, uh, as uh, Finn, I think, uh, has, uh, has um, presented me uh, quite uh, succinctly. And I um, just say that I'm very happy to be here, just surrounded by such a, a fantastic bunch of, uh, of poets. And I'm going to share just a poem that um, uh, was suggested to, to write for a competition called A Moment, 
a moment uh, before death. Kisses coating red my sadness. Awake me from the long darkness of having been engulfed in existing, of having been jailed by desire. Frozen eyes look straight up, enthralled by the immensity of life, overwhelmed by the eternity of the moment. I feel like a grain of sun on a beach. The rain washes the dirt of my soul, of years and years of desolation, of moments of moments of hurt, of memories and memories of past lives. The wind takes my lost dreams to lands where freedom rules, to lands where people smile, to lands where children play. Strange force takes my free will through the vastness of glaciers, holding away the silence of centuries, holding away the secrets of Mother Earth. The inevitable end draws me draws me upwards like an irresistible levitation to the heavens. I firmly resist the temptation to my limits. The lure of being human is a kind of madness. Hope is a spellbound engraved in humanity which can trap us in the dominion of permanence which can generate dreams and mountains of desire to prefer the path of suffering than the path of enlightenment. In the home of the holy and the hostile, the heart is crumbled in eternity. The, power, the powerful I groove on tombstones and the rest we are unsung memories. A gust of gauze, a gust of color enters my essence and freezes my entire being. As I search for, for a memory to cling on, I'm shattering pieces by impermanent. Thank you. I think that's it for tonight. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That was great. Thank you, Xavier. Thank you once more. All right, uh, moving on now, we have uh, another debut with two debutantes in a row. Would you please, um, hope you're ready, Kia Chan. And Unmute yourself. I, I, I'm always doing that and to think it's been a year. <laughs> what I was saying was uh, many apologies. I don't know why I'm in the grass. I have tried to remove the grass. Uh, it hasn't worked. So <laughs> uh, I'm just going to get on with the poem and uh, say that I don't always use rhyme in my poetry, but this is a rhyming one. And hopefully it should last about five minutes if I've timed it right. Now the question is, which window did I put it in? <laughs> it is a five minute, so it's more than a sort of one page from memory kind of thing. Okay. And it's called Hopeful Compass. Hope is an act, a muscle we retract and hold in our hearts as tears depart, warm and still. They chill the soul, screaming for change as shame joins hands. It's time to stand and give yourself a chance to move from despair. Understand when you write that sign, confined from your home, my dearest friend, you're not to lame. Your words could light the world, uncurl that fist about to hit someone's face 
and retrace the aggravation of a crumbling state. Down with capitalism. It's not some cheesy idiom that makes stats we cover. It's something to carry, to show that we care. But please be aware, down with hate is only half the debate. It dictates a problem, not how to solve it. Yes, slogans are helpful, but it takes more to be noble and create a contract of need, not growing greed, to slice through the silence, shout for equality, and truly imagine the fall of hypocrisy. Though I fear no one will follow, outside of parliament I stand, with running ink and rain-soaked hands, as passers-by whisper, why does she do this? I curl up, please let us get through this. I may make the news, a paper or two, but that does not give people a hopeful view. They need to understand my message, the shielded, are dying too. Whilst they may be COVID free, behind closed doors you don't see the lack of PPE, nor the loneliness that creeps up on me. Though it may be unfair to say hope comes from despair, that it is just a wish or a prayer which can change your mindset, but not the others out there. Unless you get up and show where the fire is burning, spreading and yearning. And what made you say that prayer? Because to swear is not to offend, but a promise to try and mend. That which is broken, can't you see? A Greenpeace badge is just a cheap token. Clapping does not help save the NHS, nor bring back the dead. Or so I say, I'll stay in silence instead and reflect what has gone. My hope is not to bring back the norm as nature warned. That is already set and bound to decay. I want us to find a new way that makes people feel truly free. So never again should anyone be treated as a commodity. This philosophy sees both hope as an action and a movement of the mind refined. I ask you, put yourself in their shoes. Imagine blind poverty and pain. They're somebody's mum, somebody's son. Their task is far from done as they wait in line shopping for the vulnerable. So if we just treat hope as a word, it will remain unheard, lying still like a weightless bird, beauty stilted in its prime, held back not by the passing of time, but our inability to realize neglect is still a crime and an absent cage. 
although rage is not the answer, we can move faster with our hearts, a leaning compass, a magnet toward the earth. We put our hands out into the fire and fulfill our desire for a positive rebirth. Thank you very much. That's all for me tonight. Sorry about <laughs> scrolling. <laughs> More than scrolling in your reading is not easy. Um, Thank you very much indeed. Thank that you so much for having me, Finn. Yeah. Powerful, powerful again. I think the future of poetry is in great hands with Alex of Kay and Kizzy and uh, oh, loads of the other ones we've come across in here. Thank you. Wonderful stuff. Okay, we're moving across uh, 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 the ocean and the land again for another first time. Please welcome uh, Meher Pistonji. Hello, thank you. I'm from India. And as uh, you guys know, uh, we are having the, one of the worst pandemics of the world at the moment. You've muted yourself. You've muted yourself again, Meha. Can you hear me? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. So I was saying that in India, we're having one of the worst the first worst experiences of the pandemic. And uh, every day we've been reading, you know, like thousand deaths, thousand deaths. And then it happened to someone in the family. And I realized how different I felt when you're just reading a bold number and when you uh, know the person you're talking about. So my first poem is called Death in Numbers. Numbers numb, blind us to faces, bodies, persons. A thousand deaths shock without pain. A single death is mourned because it's a known person. Each number from the thousand has a face, a family devastated by death. Every death creates mourners who can't forget. They will refuse to be reduced to numbers for election rallies. Their grief will bounce out of graves as ghosts deadlier than the virus, <coughs> rushing to crush men who only think in numbers. No forgetting, no forgiving. In the second poem, I try to give the numbers a persona. He was her lover. Together they started a cafe tempting test taste buds when COVID hit. But to newspapers, he was just one of a thousand deaths that day. He was old and frail cared for by a daughter who had no one once he was gone. But to newspapers, he was just one of a thousand deaths that day. She surmounted barriers to climb the highest hill of the village on one leg. Then COVID hit. But to newspapers, she was just one of a thousand deaths that day. He came on a bicycle, bringing bread and eggs to people forbidden from leaving home. But to newspapers, he was just one of a thousand deaths that day. He was the driver of an ambulance carrying living and dead bodies till he became one of them. But to newspapers, he was just one of a thousand deaths that day. Mm. 
My third poem is called Ambulance. Uh, where I live, uh, we hear the siren of ambulances every couple of hours. Ambulance. The eighth ambulance races past, siren screaming. Is the patient within a known or unknown person? Does it have oxygen, a doctor? Will they reach help in time? It's only midday. How many more before the day ends? The next one is Hawk. Heartless Hawk observes from the crest of a tree Sparrow scrambling from branch to branch, sparrows fluttering frantically, pigeons droning morosely as dry crow beaks search for life-giving water. Fires inflame hearts, fires engulf bodies. Only ash remains of loved and cherished humans. Hawk remains unflinching. Who can make him fly? And the last one, an attempt to stay sane through the catastrophe. It's called Despite Corona. Despite Corona, flowers refuse to forego the summer bloom decorating streets pink, purple, lilac, maroon. Nor does the breeze stop rustling trees as earth radiates warm soil smells waiting for the rain. Crows call, parrots shriek, white pigeons return light to a sinking sun as fireflies flash sparkles on bushes and trees. Yes, we can survive Corona. Yes, we will survive Corona. Aren't humans more resilient than flowers, birds, and trees? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Powerful and poignant words there, Maya. Thank you for coming along. Thank you. All right, moving on now. Um, no, he's not new, he's been here before, but not for a while. <laughs> Ready to go back. <laughs> Sorry, cool. Yeah, good to be back. Yeah, I was wondering if you would have remembered that same part. <laughs> um, I was going to do three short poems. Um, this one's called It's Almost Funny. It's almost funny how I'm not laughing at all, how the clouds don't stop for anyone, how impatience makes a person unhappy, how the window ends and the caterpillar cartoons night into day. That one. Um, this is a personal poem. I mean, that's the title of the poem, a personal poem. Um, also the first line, but this is a personal poem. It's self-indulgent. There's a sadness to that. This is a poem within a poem, and a poem with a poem in it. It is an ars poetica. There's a repetitiveness and an in intricateness to it. This is a form of bliss. Repetition and small details are bliss. I wake to birdsong in the morning, and before I am my eyes, I am conscious of who I am, and I wish I never moved from the small village I grew up in. I wish I never outgrew it. A child's world. I am a sad rhythm of expression, a lucky fool who has too much time and not enough time. And one more poem. All right, this is called Free Piggy Confessions, and it's um it's a tribute to Spike Hawkins' Free Pig Poems, um, and Brian Patton's Little Johnny's Confession, and they're both kind of mercy beat poets. So I kind of put both the poems together into a poem. Um, this morning, in order to escape a toxic cloud of volcanic blue, 
I stumbled into a bookshop on Botanic Avenue. In the poetry section, I found a book called Pig. The author's name was Pig. His wavy hair was like mine if I didn't cut it. I bought the pig poems for five pounds along with some Samuel Beckett translations. I went back outside where it was raining bacon. This morning, begrudgingly calling in at the Buckaroo Supper Club to ask for two weeks missing pay, I perceived that the wallpaper was mostly pink. And seeing that pigs are mostly pink, it mostly made me think of pigs. While leaving, my shoe caught a pig. I was a pig trap. On the pavement, the pig disintegrated into volcanic ash. I wiped my glasses, looked up, and a pig fell down. Yesterday, after putting pigment into the strainer all morning and producing only one cup of buckaroo pig tea, my boss took me around the back and fired me. Singing in grunts below the sun on Lincolnshire Road, I learned how much freedom from my humdrum could feel like sausages spitting or words fizzing in the back of this molten lava black pudding brain. Right, thank you. <laughs> thank you, black pudding brain. I like that. <laughs> that was great. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next up is uh, Chris. Hi, yeah. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, fine. Great. Um, I've got two. Um, they're both poems of hope. Uh, first one's rather sad, and the second one isn't, but it's not meant to be. Rose drinks our tea for Robert Samuel. The sense of a baby lately there catches the throat of a stranger in the hush of our bare hall. She sniffs at the cool air. Just a rosebud then, she is a calm brush with the other side. Hearts turn in her stare. She opens palms and fingers out the truth. If our child had lived, he would not be here. His missing decades have passed in a rush of comings and goings, lifetimes we share in this kitchen where hope is bought with cash. Rose drinks our tea and notes change hands. It's fair. Her gift is sight. For us, that's good enough. Thank you. And the second one quite different. Uh, pure fantasy. Imagine the house filling up with music when the sun comes out again. Spring round the corner. Spring wakes in a snap of the heel, a rap on the floor. The house tunes up, feet tapping the boards, set for a dance. A slide shimmies down the banister, rattling the rails, racing a reel and calling for a jig to a rock around the hall. Step hops trip to a hornpipe, polkas skip across the landing and the conga takes turns with the grapevine. Our wolf has a laugh circling the kitchen, dipping and diving the shrubbery, sashaying with a brush down the path. A verse is stalking the undergrowth, strumming the notes for a harmony, and the rhymes skip time with the washing line. The blackbird warbles from the roof, a dove struts in the yard, waving a twig, twirling a rhythm for the purring cat. Boughs swing to the scat of sparrows. Sarlings squabble, squabble for a true note. And two drakes quack in the tail of a duck. The buds unfurl in splashes of sun. Bees hum to the sweet airs of flowers. And your songs round the corners. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, lovely stuff. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Thanks. Pleasure. Thank you. Beautiful. Great. Kathy's ready to go dancing now. Look at her. <laughs> All right. Uh, oh, please welcome Lenton Carrier. Ah. Good 
Great. Thank you. Impermanence. Kindred spirits die needlessly. Mother Gaia weeps. The prana of life goes missing for many. Bodies fall helplessly in hospital corridors, gasping for air. The dead speaks of callousness. Human morbidity is still alive. Greed adorns the walls of power, playing games of chess too discomforting for the afflicted. Minds panic in terror. Hearts fly on the wings of unease as souls perish, dying needlessly for lack of the very thing that gave them meaning, oxygen. Why are we here? Not so long ago, neon lights flashed in Wuhan. The streets were filled with frivolity and zest. Fast forward a few paces in time and my liberty is a dream as Hannibal's corona elephants chase me down. A torrent of angst wandered the darkness, haunted by turbulent disquiet of the ones who fell before me of loneliness and fear. Hope roams on tomorrow's praying for answers. Faith is a dim lit candle flickering in the breeze. I walk on a road paved with uncertainty, huddling packs where visions not addressed. Happiness evades me like the tail of a dog. I rely on furloughs and food banks for daily sustenance, remembering the slogans of hands, face, space. As I survey this crowded gloomy environment, I once heard that when a predator stalks the earth, Mother Gaia sends us flames to burn his thorns. So the nemesis of avarice, supremacy and bigotry, all tussle in the fires of COVID-19, while we seek out the dawn, hoping for a brighter sunrise. Funny old world that, this paradox of harmony, of interconnectedness, I rebuff masks, vaccines, speak of liberty, while the very hands that grow my coffee, rice, weaves my fabrics, may be the ones that die tomorrow, lacking the very things I snub. Pity I have not tailor-made my own lifestyle. How I long to hear nightingales singing again, see the beauty of love in nature, Walk in the sun of the tropics to see the flowers blush as the palm trees serenade the snow white suns. My love and I splashing playfully in the aquamarine waters. I walk past a collie wagging her tail, give a cup of soup to yet another homeless human. Things are not so bad now. I enter a park where children play Remove my mask as I sit on one of the gray benches. I sip my coffee, nibble on scones, reflecting on the impermanence of each crucial breath. Sail away, sail away, sail away to Jesus. I'll finish on a lighter poem. Children of the Light. When times are hard, things don't seem right. The fog is dense and day seems night. We're insecure like thieves in flight. The path is tough, no love's in sight. We feel the pangs of fear and fright. Do summon up your soul's great might, for we're all children of the light. When fear and sorrow pierce your being, seemingly attacked by things not seen, and times are dark, the way seems mean, you feel as though you've never been alive to life's great love unseen. Look to the sun for radiance bright, for we're all children of the light. When lack of hope doth reign supreme, Replaced by fear and inner screams, no faith is there, no silent streams to calm the darkness of your dreams. Life's just not living, it would seem. 
Hold on, somehow you'll get respite. For we all children of the light. Adversity does help us grow. To progress, march, green pastures more. To see, to watch, to cherish so. When from our slumbers we do glow. As life great promise fills our poor. Then we'll be free as birds in flight. For we all children of the light. And then carry it. Thank you. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. Always a pleasure having you. Thank and you. Say hello, and say hello to grassroots, grassroots when you get there tonight. Thank you. <laughs> Thank I can you. have to stop clashing, you know, all these three <laughs> games in one night, man. All right. Um, so we're going to welcome now. We're not really sure. We're discussing this the other day. If they've been on this before, but they can't remember, and I can't remember anyway. But we're moving to Pakistan now for Fiza Rabini. Thank you, Fiza. Hi guys, I'm Fiza Abbas. I'm from Karachi, Pakistan. And uh, I'm going to read two poems today. The first poem is The Lament of uh, a Broken House. This poem is about a house that has been witness to domestic violence. So uh, let here you go. The Lament of a Broken House. I'm a house walled by inhibitions and surrounded by hopes. When I cry, windows shudder. Ceilings fail to accompany me. I feel dependent. The need to hold them overpowers me. And I ask them to stay. But they have other engagements to attend to, so they leave. Now I am at that point in life where nothing makes sense to me. My kitchen has lost its flamboyance. I no longer hear the tinkling of plates or the daily brawls of saucer and tea. The taps of my sink too have become rude. I wonder, do they know I bore them for so many years? My beautiful incandescent lamp that I bought from a local bazaar, where it was lying in a large sack among stained clothes and the wreckage of a crashed plane, has too averted its eyes from me. Remember the navy blue curtains that I adorned my bedroom with, they have signed an anti-harassment petition. She is a controlling boss who doesn't know how to behave. Thus, she should take a break and leave things as they are. My beautiful broken window pane told me this good news today while I was enjoying a tate a tate with my unhinged door. The green, beautiful plants in my garden initially decided to stay with me, but faced such a massive backlash that they had to go. Peace li lilies yelled. Baby toes protested. Right. Aloe vera helped them heal. Chrysanthemum bade farewell. Soon they all left, leaving me with a few nasty neighbors who were too showy and pretentious. Often they showed me their newly built brick walls and pearl white sash windows, wearing such a sly smile on their face that I was forced to think of those days when I was pride of the block and people used to escort their guests by telling them about me. The second poem I'm going to read is Room 411. It's about... Uh, uh, the death of my mother who passed away in 2019. She lay too confined on a hospital bed, a drape of selflessness over a camouflage of pretentiousness. She never had been this selfish. A strange air of peacefulness protected her from the thankless cries that my larynx was involuntarily producing. Its obstinacy saved me from the hefty cost, and she finally responded, firmly held my hand, moved to pearl white globular capsules, the doctor called eyes, after she lost consciousness, with her heart rate going up and down, SPO2 was not giving my mom what she deserved. I was sure she would get her due. But the oximeter self-serving attitude pissed me off. And I asked the doctor to remove the oxygen mask. Mom looked at me 
But I have to tell me that I think better than Lata because I have no brand control. Funny mom, I changed my clothes the other day, so I like me. Short mom, the blue dress I wore especially for her. She nodded. I know what you are doing, Bita. Be you. Be natural. Go and never wash your face. My eyes are accustomed to the symbols of your indolence. Don't disappoint me with these ornaments of self care. The belief, the left side of mom's brain was severely damaged, but I think mom went over her stroke. But her adamant brain needed an outlet to show its strength, so it stopped functioning. A flower calmly rests in my hand, enveloping the small grains of sand that I secretly stole from my mom's grave to tell others my interpretation of peace. Thank you. Oh, thank you, thank you. Wow, wonderful, powerful piece, especially on this uh, Mother's Day for a lot of the world too. Thank you. Wow. Oh, me, I need a drink. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Greg. Gregory Lannan. Hey, Finn. Uh, good to be here. I've lurked a few times um, and uh, have had a last few months, actually, a general case of poetry writing block. But uh, I've, I've got a, a few poems here that are fairly, fairly new. Um, this, this first one, I do want to just go ahead and say that I do consider myself a, a sex positive person. You know, I think you should be able to live your life the way you want to, as long as you're not hurting somebody and being uh, and uh, not and being unethical about it. And uh, and and this is um, a poem about somebody I know who is is um, uh, sort of not, uh, in my opinion. So you guys can take this infatuation. Infatuation is just a rumor. A rough draft to be traded for something more finished. A jigsaw puzzle with mismatched pieces, making a Picasso portrait, but not on purpose because of lack of purpose. Can it be intimate if intimacy is without blood, without a heart whose beating is increased, a body unengorged with meaning? But your fluids are only borrowed in vanilla, quickly cooled and fruitless, alone only of the body's mystery, a wet riddle written on an erasable surface, your partner's heart confused if they think you're actually naked. But you're not really there. You've protected your heart. You've set your arbitrary boundaries, asking for them to be respected, constructed by your disrespect of a boy who's revealed his manly interest because setting boundaries is more mature than wanting everything your way and treating it as a game you write the rules for. Oh yes, you've opened more than your door. You've let your armor down to your ankles, your portal exposed, but inside you've built a wall and your lover's words are just rumors to you because you mistake sex for satisfaction and infatuation for making love. And that's that. Uh, this is um, uh, a pandemic themed poem. And I uh, just want to preface, I am in the US. I'm in Tennessee uh, in one of the counties and in one of the cities that has least taken COVID lightly. I mean, that's not what I meant to say. That it couldn't take COVID any lightly. It's, it's been a joke here. And uh, this poem is called Pandemonium. It hasn't been a year yet of this six foot confusion, the masquerade and the irrational debate about whose lives matter, the persistence of both new and very old plagues. Tiny unseen devils like viruses infected the minds of man centuries ago, a contagion spread over generations, a white blight, leprosy under the skin. And now we are truly possessed and seem almost forced to self-harm. Pandemonium is at hand. I wash my palms, trying to avoid spreading what others are denying, breathing rough like a plague doctor, 
Oh yes, my temperature is high from rising blood pressure and a mind that refuses to sleep and the heat is on. Our cities like kilns with white hot rage where alabaster cities become darker as the streets are disputed as we try to reconcile hundreds of thousands dead through apathy while we protest because one man couldn't breathe. And behind my mask, there is the whimper of an inundated empathy. A whisper like wasps escapes like steam through clenched teeth. A citizen of a country in which possibly no lives matter and in which no life is precious. Health isn't cared for if you can't afford it. An ideology that values wealth creates what is a poor excuse for a nation. And my hope is that error, facades, and hate, even if it will, it will still take decades, even centuries of, of creating that immunity against trying to make our skins into sins, the vaccination has to go under the skin, under your skin like an unseen itch. You wound yourself all day scratching in futility. My hope is that even all this irrational, imaginary evil will die, even if it has to kill us, the U.S. And uh, I've got just one more here. The feeling, the feeling of being top heavy the toxins of trauma leaking down into my shoulders, infecting into permanent pain, a weight, my own millstone I made. The feeling of being the other, born into a land of waste, displaced epiphanies wasted on me, trying to rise the feelings of having feet of clay. The feeling of being tired of feeling, Caring about a bleak landscape, a land diseased by toxic ideologies, loathing where I uh, was and where I am, so tired of caring about the willfully lost. Hope fades in this mindset. It is more than a chemical imbalance, heavier than milliliters of the wrong hormones, a neck chronically stiff from bearing another's burdens. Love seems a waste unreciprocated by takers, an infection contracted by trying to be an other. My head so full of waste, my heart seems to pump the same. The feeling of not feeling, numb and cold, being displaced means being alone, wanting to be cared for but feeling loathed and expendable. But then I realized loathing and hatred are feelings. And my heart does beat. My blood is fighting, not fleeing. And my, lim my limbs feel warm, even if my fists are cold and hard and heavy. I remember my heart is a soft muscle, a necessary engine of lightness. And it feels like love, hangs like a dove in my chest even if everything else is heavy. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Thank you. Great way to come back from your poetry box, I know. <laughs> Thanks, right. Cheers. Uh, all right. We're moving on now to, um, yeah, another debutant, another country, Romania. Uh, you'll know him from Poets of the East. I don't think it is pronounce his name right, Machia Danguta. Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, it is an honor and a privilege being here. Uh, I would like, first of all, to congratulate you for this beautiful initiative and uh, all the uh, poets that have read until now. I was deeply impressed, but uh, from what I by what by what I have heard uh, until now, uh, I hope my texts will not disappoint either. Once again, thank you very much. Uh, 
The first poem I'm going to read is called The Raven, and it is inspired by an old legend from the Caribbean. The Raven. I guess he knew, or he was told, they weren't trusting him at all. Nevertheless, he left his ancient winter cold, eternal night, and towards them he flew, dressed in that heavy raven skin, for bringing them the light, the warmth from heaven. He thought this was his destiny. He was the raven. However, when he got there and they saw how blind they were and they had been, how ugly and how mean, he got so angry right away. And it was nothing more to say they curse the warmth, the light, and all they saw and they had never seen before. All he had brought them, also him, his love for them as well, and all the ravens in the world, they sent them all to hell. And then he stammered for the first time in his life. So sad he was, so silent and so slow. There was no place to dwell, no place to go, but that old heavy raven skin it was within it that he found again that ancient winter dark, eternal night, his place to be, his black ivory tower. And thus he finally understood this was his destiny, the real Raven power. Now, the next poem. Uh, is a kind of uh, memory to the to the Christmas understood in a uh, understood in a certain personal uh, personal way. So just a moment. It is quite here. Dictum three. Jumping Axis, dedicated to the Czech poet Radek Friedrich. I fulfilled all the tasks I was entrusted with. I welcomed the good news they announced. I kept looking out over our symbiosis while continuing to observe or only implementing since now, I don't remember anymore, the recommended social distancing. I found out in time about the genocide. I took you on that trip. We reached the city. We found the shelter and I met some of the ones living there. Now we could finally have some sleep for we needed a good rest after all that had happened and before all that was said to follow. But when I woke up, I didn't recognize anything around. What's that tree with those lights above? About this violet heart between us? And who are you? The next poem is uh, remembering from the hospital as I made the COVID in a quite serious form in December. Diagnosis. We were born asymptomatic. We were granted an asymptomatic contamination. We were hospitalized as asymptomatic. Therefore, the therapy is of course symptomatic. Discharge forms are issued at own risk and based on workplace certificate. We are no standard cases, but unexploited niche opportunities. Drinking water available in the emergency room. 
and the final text I prepared uh, for today is called Vector Edition. I am the one that is only equal to itself, but different from its own identity. I am the one breaking the balance of the landscape seen with both eyes. I am the one adding an A before the world symmetrical. I am the one because of which one can't say one's prayer until the end. For I am neither the father nor the son, and I am not allowed to pretend I'd represent something holy, let it be a spirit or a ghost. I am the one nobody wants to have children with, even if I were able to give birth to children. I am fat when anyone else is white. I am black when anyone else is clever. I am stupid when anyone else is brutal. I am oversensitive when anyone else is slim or by reverse. I was not born a woman. Even if anyone else is able to become one, they say, or by reverse. I am the different one, different from you, different from her, different from him. I am the unlikely one. I am the third one. So don't tell me I'm beautiful, for you know I'm not, and I know I am. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you, sir. Thank you. Wow, love that. Love that, sir. Thank you. Okay, we'll swap around a bit of the order if anyone ever remembers it from when I put it online, but who does? Uh, Michael, Michael Sindler. Hello, hello. Thank you so much. Ty, it is just so amazing being part of this global community of artistry and empathy and compassion. Um, you know, in the last year, I've shared space with people from over 50 countries now who would have ever imagined. Um, so, so grateful. Um, this first piece is called Archipelago. I am from a broken chain on a lock gate frozen, cracked, flaked with rust, crumbling, falling modes indistinguishable from dirt, inseparable from spirit, minute skeleton keys to memory. I am from an archipelago of souls whose links fell into the sea. Those who can never know home, can never look back, never dock in ports where tattered canvas portraits flutter and reach towards their truth on a ship that has sailed. I am from those whose history was burnt to ash, absent voices that neither sing nor shout, bones piled in heaps reveal no secrets, can never speak, can never sleep. I am from surprised sailors who set sail before the last gleam of day winked out on the forsaken shore, blown by the wind of things to come, west towards hope. I am from dank tenements filled with rag pickers, fruit merchants, corner side vendors, and sweatshop tailors, choked by coal dust laid over blocks, a settled coat blown up from rutted streets, echoing clanking carts, cobbling a close-knit woven community full of song, needled with embroidered hope stitched into tradition. I am from a broken chain on a lock gate of a fallen wall, flattened in a storm called progress. And I will do one more 
and this is called Smaller Cousin for Joy Harjo. Joy tells me I am the smaller cousin of the sun. I burst with heat. I warm the world with rhythmic beat. I wither away your lengthening shadows that thin into harmless reflections. I am the smaller cousin. I stand close. You can feel me deep in your chest as we embrace skin of your drum vibrating in harmony. We are an expanding dancing circle. I am the smaller cousin of the sun. I rise, fall, and rise again. You can count on my return. Every moment apart brings me closer once again. I dry your tears with my breath and wait among the clouds, watching as pure rain washes you clean. I am the cousin of the sun, caressing the curve of the earth, reflecting poetry against the mirror of the moon. Even when you do not see me, I send my message of love from the silvered surface, scythe to circle and rotation. I am the smaller cousin of the sun. I am the brother, sister to your heart. I am the same pounding sound of life and love, the same struggling triumphant pump, fist-sized and world-encompassing. We are the smaller cousins of the sun, our warmth, warmth, nurturing each other, reaching out our rays, braiding light into threads, a sheet of pure love to lay across the land and sky. Okay, thank you all very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Michael. I know you're feeling a bit weary today, so thank you, sir. Great beat points. Okay, um, yeah. Right. I'm going to do something different now. You know, like a, um, a collaboration throughout the time. This is one with a difference. I'm going to read... Uh, yeah, I'm really actually nervous about this, but I'm going to read one of Kathy Carson's poems. And then Kathy's got to read one of mine. So it could be a case of a double box of Kleenex coming up, maybe. Anyway, uh, I hope I do this one justice because we've all heard Kathy do it and it is great. Uh, it's called Capitals. I am sorry in capitals, in neon lights, in airplanes that write the letters in the sky. I am sorry for the armor I wore in the beginning. You see, it kept me safe in a home full of hurt. But for you, it made me unreachable. For every kindness I weaponized, hurled back at you, because when I tried to hold them, they turned to glass in my hand. For every argument I orchestrated, calculated, manipulated, engineered, because I was unraveling. And I just needed to feel in control of something. For the pushback, pull away, in, out, on, off, chaos, confusion I caused in your mind trying to find what would make you snap. Because I needed to know what that looked like. For the shame I made you feel when you showed me. For behaving in ways that were as unlovable as I felt just so I could feel like my outsides matched my insides, forever bringing you to a place of pain just so I wouldn't feel so alone in mine for not understanding back then all that all that anger came from needs never met. For that all I ever had to do with you was ask. I am thankful for arms that are always open for the 22-year-old you who kissed me on the forehead, told me the war I was waging it was nothing to do with you, but that you loved me and you would ring me in the morning. You were right. For patience, persistence, kindness, compassion, never earned but given without condition. For the times 
you hold me so tight. All my broken parts fuse back together. For the times I almost walked away. But I stayed. Because that tug towards you was more powerful than I could ever be. For the way you dragged me kicking and screaming from the water. You see, I thought I was swimming. But you could see I was drowning. For that place just below your collarbone. Where if I press my ear. I can hear the thump of your heart. Slow my breath, through. my thump synchronizes with yours. But something about that but always, always still me. I am thankful in capitals, in neon lights, in airplanes, the letters in the sky. I am thankful. Right. All right, Kathy, take it away. <laughs> oh, thank you for that. That was amazing. That was really powerful. Thank you for that so much, Finn. I'm nervous doing yours as well, more nervous than I am with my own. This is called Reasons to Love by the incredible Finn Hall. At times, love dies. For reasons unknown, love dies. But if we love someone enough, can we stop them from dying? We hold them so close in our hearts, the hearts that beat and synchronize time, except that words aren't always needed, that the shared air we breathe is enough. Enough to be in the same room, the same space, the same time as each other. Travel in the same journey. I am happy to be shipwrecked in your shores, to be the flotsam and jetsam of your life. Keeping my head above the waterline in your vision to know that we are always in reach of each other, always, always traveling on the same inspirational adventure together, always floating in the same waves, but what if we drifted apart? Still in love, but just out of reach of each other. Lifesavers hiding in the midst. Fingers grasping, arms outstretching, reaching them beached up. Face down in the sands of time. Gasping for air. Wanting to share the air with you. Cast away, far away, away you are so far. And all I have of you is the memory and the comfort of still loving you, even though your physical presence is no longer around, but at least I have you still. Still in my beating heart, a heart that once beat in time in rhyme with yours. Now all that is around me, all that here surrounds me, are sequins, glitter and regret. Regret that we had unfinished plans of land still to see and places to be. At times love dies for reasons unknown. Love dies. I held you in my arms as you died. And now I hold you forever in my heart. And my heart will beat for the two of us. Thanks, Finn. <laughs> Ah, oh, thank that. you, my friend. Oh, that was brilliant. Oh, brilliant. I'm in tears and I wrote it for goodness sake. <laughs> thank you. Whew. Oh, thank you. I, I just can move on. I could get any more than that. That was uh, well worth the wait, Kathy. Thank you for reading that for me and agreeing to do that too. Okay, we're moving on now. We're rising up towards the break. Um, so we have someone who's got to go away soon too and it's first time here so would you please welcome Kayana the artist hello everybody can you hear me yep all right my name is Kiana the artist I'm from United States as well I'm out here in Atlanta Georgia 
Um, I have two poems for you guys. And I'm reading from my book for the month, Why We Won't Tell versus Why Anyone Listens. And this book is based on um, people that's mental illness to domestic violence and different things like that. So different. I was born to be different. When man sees, God sees differently. I'm special in a different way. I talk different, speak different, look a different way and dress a different way. God says, I am the head and not the tail. Believe in God, believe also in me. I will never be able to fit inside a box. I was only able to fix outside the box. I would never to be fit inside a group. I was born to be different. And this dedicated to people from mental illness, disability, uh, especially in this time right now. Um, my heart goes out to anyone that's dealing with mental illness and um, hope they recover. All in one, the attitude of character to visible character to visible love to unspoken word. I'm the artist, I'm the artist. He believe in God, believe also in me. I'm a woman, I'm a woman. I'm a woman with faith with God, what matters to me, what falls in place to never justify what you could become. Every day is a new day. Every day is a bright and sunny day. I tend to be with my friends and become even more. My deepest fear is to believe in yourself, to judge me because I am black. This moment of speech, now walk in my shoes, now walk in my shoes. My naysayers can't say what to say about you because I am somebody, because I am somebody. To the natural hair, to the natural eyes, to the natural lips. Look at me, I'm natural. He says he terms you, is this mic on? Can I have your attention, please? Words and words and words, reality. So why I am here? Because of the next generation. Thank you guys. And thank you for having me on TI Open Mic. Um, I'll put out my information in the chat box. Um, I do host an open mic, um, third and fourth Saturdays in the spring and the summertime. And thank you. Uh, thank you, Kian. That was great. Thanks for reaching out to join us here. Thank you. Okay. Richard Harris. Hello. And I've got to apologize again. Because of my deafness, I am on this portal and I can't join in and say how wonderful you are. There's no chat on it. I can see the chat, but I can't reply. You've all been fantastic but I haven't made a sim single comment and I feel really guilty. Anyway, right. Because uh, I can't hear you on my phone. I can only hear you on this. So it's hearing you or talking to you. Yeah. And these are poems that I've written over a long period of time and I've kind of joined them together for today. They're all quite little. Two boys. Two boys played in the street, had fun, laid a foundation stove for a new church, posed with trowels in the sun, went to school together, had fun, grew older after senior school. At 14, one went on the rugby pitch, ran, tackled, collapsed, died. Had a heart condition that no one knew about. He never made 21, had no more fun. I am 69. I am the other boy. The church is now weathered and old, as am I. I have had so much fun. That's not fair. So why did I survive? Words of a stranger. I was seated in a room in an old house, feeling alone, but with other people. Group therapy, counselling, facilitator present. I was telling my story of abuse, of depression, of my stepmother trying to have sex with me when I was 14. A stranger, a new member, a young man I did not know, spoke. He told me it was not my fault. I had been a kid. I was stunned. It took a stranger speaking the truth to bring me relief and forgiveness. To forgive myself for something I had not actually done, I did have no blame. I felt lead weights lifting from my shoulders, lead weights that I had carried for 30 years. I cried. I howled. I emptied myself of the guilt, the guilt that I should not have carried at any time. 
and certainly not so soon after my mother's death. Black dog. I lie there, depressed, clothes, bedclothes over my head to shut the world out and hope flies out of the window. Life is rich with highs and lows, memories sweet and dark. I am down and can see no way forward, so down there is nowhere lower. There could not be, could there? Cannot imagine even moving my legs just now. Standing up will be too much. The phone rings, cannot respond. Doorbell rings, I don't respond. Don't want to let anyone in into my life. Can't, don't want to move. The darkness is here. The black dog has enveloped me, devouring my spirit, overpowering. The next time I move physically will be when my bladder dictates it. I'll need to be desperate, then straight back to bed, comforting bed, the only place I can survive, bedding over my head, and so it goes on drearily. Never ending, it seems, but somehow time is suspended, with hope having flown out of the window. Gradually, somehow, some feeling returns. I manage to get up and sit, sit and watch TV, comedy, but little goes in, and then back to bed. Takes time so long, but with love and support and nurturing by a surprisingly small group. I gradually get well this time, and I will be stronger again. What's more, I hope. After depression, after depression and pain, the loss of self-esteem, the dullness of days, bedclothes over the head days, comes relief and calm, sweet balm, sometimes then all is well. Never want to go back to hell. But. And then finally, um, thank you very much for all the lovely applause I can, I'm aware of out of the corner of my eye, dealing with it. I will deal with it, deal with it, deal with it. I will deal with it. All my life I've said this. I've said it out loud and in my head. I have felt it, hurt it. I have dealt with it. Lies and hate and derision, non-acceptance, slights and loss. I have dealt with it, dealt with it, dealt with it, dealt with it. I have dealt with it indeed. I have survived bereavement, unemployment, uncertainty, being let down. It made me strong. I am not a survivor. I am a thriver. I have dealt with it, dealt with it, dealt with it. I moved on. I've had liars, control freaks and alcoholics in my life. And I dealt with it and moved on. Now I am older, not yet too old. And I still deal with it, deal with it, deal with it, and will always move right on. And I felt they kind of went together, and they're from all sorts of disparate periods of my writing, but I had a real deep think about block today. So thank you very much. And you dealt with it well, Richard. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay. Uh, a couple more before the break. It's end of a long first half, but uh, the nature of the beast. Um, you please welcome another debutante from, ooh, all the way near that far from me. Please welcome <laughs> Molly McLachlan. Oh, Molly. Hello, Finn. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so I'm beaming into you from um, Aberdeen Central, uh, which is fine, um, but i still feeling a bit sore about the result in Aberdeenshire West that was announced yesterday, which is where I grew up. Um, <laughs> so I thought I would read this, this poem, um, which I wrote quite recently. And I think I'm going to develop it into a bigger thing, but it just felt a bit fitting and it's called Paradox. Heard they were opening a new fast food joint in town. Some Pepsi Co American export, of course, punting gentrified Mexican food at low, low prices. People were very excited about this. So I thought I would go down and check it out, see what all the fuss was about. Shouldn't have bothered. The queue was round the block and the food was shite. Heard the folk who hand out hot meals every Sunday night in the square have been struggling to keep up with demand recently. 
say you need a referral for the food bank, so people are slipping through the cracks and then they end up here, queuing for hours in Baltic conditions for soup and a sandwich, bag of crisps and a cup of tea. Heard they sold this land to a developer. In six months, it will be a building site and another six months after that, there will be suburban family homes as far as the eye can see. Three to five bedrooms, two and a half bath, and of course, they'll have to include the government mandated affordable housing, though fuck knows by whose standards they are measuring affordable. Heard they found someone else frozen to death after sleeping rough in the snow last night. Every time the weather changes, there's stories like this. And every time there's budget cuts, another shelter closes. It gets so cold here after nightfalls, even in the summer, and the sleeping bags crumpled in doorways aren't enough to keep the chill from your bones. Heard they're knocking down the market to build luxury office suites. That's exactly what this city needs, right? Enough more office buildings to sit vacant floor upon floor of high-end glass and chrome, all dead silent and empty, standing by, waiting for money that is never coming back. Heard they shut up shop without warning the staff who found out in the news, just like the rest of us. Imagine that, <laughs> coming home from work and switching on the telly to find out that you don't have a job to go back to tomorrow. The city centre will be a ghost town soon with nothing left but boarded up shop front and fast food joints. Ah, oh, yeah, it's a frustrating time here <laughs> in Scotland. <laughs> And um, what else will I do? I, I actually have no idea. I think I will. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, I just read in the chat. I think I will read another mildly one that's got my like, well, but it speaks a little bit to the Northeast um, identity since we're here with people from all around the world and uh, Scotland is for some reason more in the spotlight than it ever has been before. So um, here's a poem about being the Aberdeen and the difficulties and uh, paradoxes that come with that. This town is a seaside town. You can feel it in the air when the har wraps round, smell the salt nip your nose and the rain lashing down, hear the selfie songs of old in the wind as it howls. This town is a seaside town. It feels different in the summer. Winter is long and bitter, but the minute it gets warmer, Archie's silvery structures seem to sparkle in the sun and the sea's still hoora freezing, but the beach is overrun. Bare-chested loons shouting, Monodon, still cheerful in defeat. Barbecues rolled out of sheds when it passes 10 degrees. Happy drunks line Belmont Street as teens smoke weed atop St. Nick's. You learn to savour summer when it passes by so very quick. Though slowly, slowly, Year by year, these dear brief months get hotter and we wonder, after we are gone, what will be lost to fire and flood water. This town is a seaside town grown gassy bloated and granite tough. The old fisher folk have long since drowned. The snarling seas rise ever more rough. These rigged up levees were bound to burst, but the ships still go to work each day. The fossils of the fisher folk shake their heads and swear they never lived so wastefully. 
this town is a seaside town. But it is easy to forget when you're around the Silver City so long that the golden sands exist, the culture, like the dunes along the shoreline slowly shifts. We were always close to water. It was not the waves which set us adrift. This town is a seaside town. And we would do well to remember when the grey-faced rat race gets us down and we are feeling quite untethered. Take a breath. Doctor's orders. Two muckle lungfuls of briny air. Cast your eye to the horizon. Count the waves that break out there. Thank you very much, folks. And thank you for all your lovely comments in the chat. And I've really enjoyed hearing all your poems. Can't wait to hear the rest of them. Thank you, Finn. No problem, Molly. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Great as always. Put your details, whatever you want, in the chat. Because there's... Uh... Yeah, just do that. <laughs> right. Um, a couple of more before the break. Uh, so you please welcome uh, General Lisa Mo. I'm here. Can you hear me? I'm sorry. I didn't realize I was going to be so soon. Yeah, you are, sir. So, yep. Sorry about that. Um, bear with me. Okay. I'm going to start with this piece called The Afterlife of a Tear. Um, the Afterlife of a Tear. Every tear I cry, tears a hole in my brain to reserve a place for a memory to reside. Sometimes certain memories decide to burrow a little further than others. So when they get remembered, they have to be triggered. Sometimes someone will commit a crime against me. I forgot I had previously experienced and I see the previous perpetrator's face and the current perpetrator's face, which might make me scream loud enough to make him or her go deaf. There are memories we want to remember forever. There are memories not consequential enough to keep forever. Then there are memories that hide away in their burrowed holes that leave permanent residue in our souls called trauma. And here we go. I'm going to do this one piece for you called, we can get to it, Unrequited. I am a deer in the headlights of your presence, just the side of you. When you graze my elbow unintentionally, oops. When you lightly tap me on the shoulder, when you say hello to me, God help my heart if you wave or smile at me from across a crowded room, if you dare to look me in the eyes. For me to tell you how I feel would make my heart beat so fast. I would have to jump out of my chest to survive. I will write my feelings in a poem, in a squiggly black and white cardboard covered comp book. Tear the page from the notebook, fold it in third, shove it in an unmarked envelope under a pile of paid bills in my desk drawer so I shall never risk reading it to you or anyone else. If I did so, I might learn why the word crush exists. You could hold my mushy heart in your hands and twist it and wring out my ability to smile, leaving only residual heartbreak tears that would never dare exit my eyes. I will take a deep breath. I shall never exhale. I will accept our existences as separate. I will accept being afraid of my own shadow is the same as being afraid of being in love. I will hope that one day you will reciprocate my feelings without my expressing them to you so I can finally be able to read you this poem. And may I do one more, Finn? Hello? Yeah, sure, of course, of course, Brian. Okay, blame the sun for the rain. This rain, this rain, banging on my window pane is messing with my brain, making me feel something other than plain or maybe not so sane. I feel like whooping, like a whooping crane, whoop, whoop, whoop. 
or maybe chewing chewing gum on a choo-choo train traveling from the Cali coast to the coast of Maine, this rain, this rain, this early May state of Maine rain, drip, drip, dripping, drop, drop, dropping, flipping and flopping like flip flops, flipping, flopping all over the place, taunting, cu taunting cucumbers and tomatoes to rise from the ground so we can make icy cold de gazpacho on sweltering hot sun sunny July and August days. I'm thinking maybe we could use a little more rain that might drive us insane, but this rain, this rain, this rain is only water. Pieces of clouds falling from the sky, pitter pattering against spinning rooster weather vanes, pounding on roofs, clang, 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 making us feel like we need to get out of the house, but we don't want to drive in it. But then again, it makes us hungry and no one wants to cook on a rainy day. So it teases us by becoming heavier, throwing lightning in the air, whips around a little wind, screams with thunder. Then it decides not to stay, to move on and make its way to taunt someone else in some other place only after the sun pays. But the rain charges the sun when it needs to take itself a break. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, Brian. Cheers once again. Thank you very much. Okay, one more before we have a short, short break. Um, Andy N. Andy, mate. Evening, all guys. We all all right? So, my name is Andy N. I'm over from the Manchester area. So, I co run a literature night over there called Speakeasy. And I also have a podcast called Spoken Label, which is a poetry podcast which Finn's been on. Richard, who is here somewhere, has been on. And Kathy Carson has been on a lot of that I know of in the audience tonight. So always looking for new people. Our oh, bus links are later. Now, the two pieces I'm going to do tonight are from my upcoming book I'm working on at the moment. And this is a book called Changing Carriages at Birmingham New Streets. It's a series of letters between a couple. So this is the first piece, and it's called Hiding in the Black Horse in Farmworth. And the Black Horse is a pub over in the Farmworth area. And this is very early in the book. Do you remember the fact we were still really... I'll oh, start again. Do you remember the fact we were still really strangers, Sarah? Not even a couple. When you came to meet me in Farmworth, that lunchtime, just after I returned to work, and we ended up sneaking out of the Black Horse when my boss walked in over an hour late into my lunch. Do you remember telling me in that stark, knuckle-stained light under my breath when you walked into the side door and you saw me go white-faced? Why do you just tell the truth? That we simply lost track of time rather than rush out the other exit. You must be joking. My voice crackled under my breath like a dodge on a ghost train track, rubbing my nerves into bite-sized chunks. Soothed by the way you followed me into the consuming mist, without batting an eyelid. I picture you even now, running through the rain to where we were parked. Your hat sank over your nose, carrying your shoes after they turned into cups of water and stood there laughing when we both got back to our cars. You couldn't have planned it. I remember you saying, who would have thought she would turn up when we were in there laughing to yourself your laughter catching the rain in the motion. Leave me unaware, even then, how much impact you were about to live on my life. Okay. Poem number two. This is another one, then set in a area called Tantal Hill, which is a beautiful hillside, countryside, on the outskirts of Manchester. So this is called Rainstorms on Tantal Hill. Listening to the rain at home. Do you remember that time, Sarah, when we went walking over Tandle Hill and the heavens suddenly exploded, soaking everything at the summit and leaving us with nowhere to hide before we got to the pub at the other side of the hill? Do you remember the landlord saying we'd look like drowned rats before passing us some towels, almost like they were expecting it? And then there was an old man by the door, looking at the storm like he was perched in regret, 
ripped from another lifetime. You wanted to check he was okay. In hindsight, I should have gone over, but my mind was elsewhere, far away from the worry in your eyes, centered much more inward, worrying about ourselves, not other people's demons tangled in self-portrait. Our two storylines came together for just a few moments into the same plot line, pulling itself together like it did to us later. And you walked into the shadows, unable to face your past, leaving me perched in regret, rattling my heart to a standstill. That's me done, guys. It's been a great night. Take care. See you all later. Uh, cheers, Andy. Thanks, mate. Cheers. Thank you. Right, it's uh, time is it? It's 11 minutes past nine. We're going to take a uh, five minute break or so, and then, uh, yeah, then we'll be back for the second half. It's a bit short, and I'll put the running order up during the break. You can go and get your coffees, your beers, whatever. Thank you. Right. It's uh, five minutes point time, which is usually about 10 minutes or something in the, <laughs> in the real world. Um, we're going to get ready to go again. If uh, everyone put the revised running order in, because um, it's never the same as it is when I put it online, because people ask to go at different times and people different time zones, and that's understandable. So we're going to start off with... Uh, to your Joe. Cheers, Finn. Okay, so I'm going to do a couple of short poems and then a couple of longer poems. Um, and I don't think I've done any before. I keep trying to remember fittings I've done here and I can't remember. <laughs> so apologies if I have done the same one. I'm not keeping a comprehensive list. Okay. So this one is called Heart's Desire. Feathers of hope beat strong in most, but never a genuine flutter in mine. I'm labeled other, monster to some. Once guilt chipped into a fleeting, maybe, but this is not hope. Hope is a powerful force, like the daily gratitude that soars in me on escaping this trap. She said, it's what we should do. I disagree. I'm content with different kinds of love. My hopes are not tied up in a white frock, man-made picket fence or a Pinterest perfect abode. Glamour exists in heels, on red carpets, complicated, shiny worlds I choose not to live in. Give me mat, flat comforts, and nothing around my neck. Okay, I'm going all serious tonight. <laughs> <laughs> And those serious poems out. Uh, this one is called Lighthouses. Him shaped whirlpools royal around, stealing breath and time. She clings to floating debris, an old tie, a plastic keyring, an appointment card. Scraps of memory, his laugh, that smile, eroded slowly one storm at a time. Numb, freezing, she treads familiar water, ignoring lighthouses on the shore, mouthing, we're here, take our hand. Okay, and this one is called Trinkets, which is still in my work in progress folder because I'm not quite finished, which is why I wanted to read it, to hear it out loud. 
our trinket boxes burst with unwanted gifts. Glittering silver-tongued shuriken disguised as love. Impounded to airless pigeonholes, we're instructed to smile, show gratitude. We reject aubergine pearls from around our wrists and necks, formed by gaslit fingers and fists. We claw back, dull rubies congregate, gossip atop snapped half nails, exchange pains, swim in shimmering droplets of guilt. Maybe it's our fault. We scour ourselves for reasons. Does not fit, damaged, faulty. A close inspection by an independent body willing to uphold our basic rights declares our true worth. Priceless diamonds, we are our own best friends. The return slip reads, found better elsewhere. Okay, and this is gonna be the last one, which is also a work in pro, I'm reading my work in progress. <laughs> I'm older for poems than I, it's called TikTok. No time, I want to stay. The clock strikes responsibility, need money, rent to pay, scribble furiously. Don't forget, TikTok. I want to feel the girth of you between my fingers as it slides up, down, ink oozing on paper, write, writhe, play with words pleasing to the tongue and ear. It pours from me like pints of blood I let for love or what I considered it to be. Wonder wantonly, trace your lines, finger your beauty, read me out aloud. Give me your full attention. I miss you. The clock tuts its disapproval, tick tock. You're single, still alone. He's in your head, your heart, your bed, and here he is taking over the fucking page again, spreading like a virus through your consciousness. And you let him. Remembering the dead gives you a reason to keep your heart beating. And this half angel on my shoulder might crush me and I will have to fly with him or set him free. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Joe. Wow, I think I've seen you do so many serious poems in one go. That was great, quite lovely. <laughs> thank you. All right. Uh, okay, we've got a, a run of debutants just now, so... Um, Please welcome Claire Duthie. Thank you, Claire. Hi, everyone. I thought I'd do a, a longer poem and then a very short one. So I'll we'll start with this one. It's all about a variety in character scenes that's creating much full of goodness. And it's all about created by a scientist to, and being the cause of Indian farmers, which is very bad at the moment. So it's called Pusita, Pusa Acita. Pusa Acita, sent from India to the USA and back to Britannia. Full of goodness and flavour, be safe for them. Yet there's a tragedy in her majesty. They can no longer be imported and must be deported. To this year's crop, there's a stop. Old seed cannot be used. It withers and dies in my parts. The best laid plans of mice and men sometimes come to fruition. fruition. Yet I don't despair. I prepare to turn off a matter to the goddess Yamuna. Yamuna. 
to new stock I turn to be planted in the ground. I hope that it sounds and the sound of sound the pound. So that's the first one. And the second one is a lot shorter and it's dedicated to the young eco-activist Greta Thunberg. And it goes like this. Greta went to sea in a yacht to stop the world being hot. I thought I'd write it for a young child just to explain who she was and what she was about. And hopefully it will be them to ask other questions about her. Like, Mummy, what does hot mean and yachts and all this and so on? So thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Claire. Thank you. Sudden stop there. <laughs> Unexpected, but thank you. That was great. Thank the screen you. froze just as you stopped as well. So that was uh, fine. Thank you. Um, the next one, moving to uh, Colin now. Sophie. Hi. Um, well, this is my first time. Oh, dear. Well, this is my first time here. And I'm from Amsterdam. Netherlands and um, I have um, well yeah um, I was planning on uh, performing this poem which I wrote in Dutch and um, because I joined a songwriting uh, workshop for my singing teacher and apparently the songs were um, poems so um, yeah, I wrote a lot more after that, but um, okay. Well, I was thinking of doing it first in Dutch and then in English, so you know what I'm saying. Um, yeah, and it's quite a personal poem. So yeah, that's, that's maybe good to note. Okay. Um, van confrontatie komt frustratie. Frustratie dat je wil slaan. Slaan om het slaan. Zo hard slaan dat je moet huilen en eigenlijk niet meer verder kan. Maar je moet door. Je moet door, ook al kan je niet meer verder. Je wil vechten. Vechten tegen alle stomme mensen. Stomme mensen zijn er genoeg. Sommigen zijn als vergif, waarvan je net te veel slokjes hebt gehad. Slokjes die je beter niet had kunnen nemen. Maar je moet door. Je moet door, ook al kan je niet meer verder. Verder. Je gaat verder en voelt je vrij. Vrij van frustratie, vrij van confrontatie. Confrontatie omdat het leuk is. Leuk omdat, het, omdat je kalm bent. Kalm omdat je niet meer hoeft te slaan. Maar je gaat door. Je gaat door omdat je verder kan. Je gaat door omdat je een killer queen bent. So that was the Dutch one. And um, yeah, I've been told that my body language is, I, I did this um, last Wednesday doing the sidewalk Beirut and then I did it the other way around. But yeah, apparently my body language changed when I, when I did it in Dutch. So maybe I chose that maybe to do it in Dutch first. So now it's in English, so you know what I'm saying. From confrontation comes frustration. Frustration that you want to punch. Punch for the punching. To punch so hard that you need to cry and really can't continue. But you have to keep going. You have to keep going even if you can't continue. You want to fight, fighting against all stupid people. Stupid people are enough of. Some people are like poison that you've just taken too many sips of. Sips that you've better not been taken, but you have to keep going. You have to keep going even if you can't continue. Continuing. You keep continuing and you feel free. Free from frustration, free from confrontation. 
Confrontation, because it's fun. Fun, because you're calm. Calm, because you don't need to hit to punch anymore. But you keep going. You keep going because you can continue. You keep going because you are killer queen. So that was that one. And um, yeah, I think I still have time. So um, this is also quite challenging for me because um, I wrote, um, well, yeah, the, um, the killer queen poem was about kickboxing. And somebody told me like, okay, if you can write about that, you can write about anything. So I wrote a poem about having red hair. And um, I'm not sure if he's still here, but I've noticed that Jamie's in the room and I, I noticed he has red hair as well. And I think this is the first time I'm performing it um, with another red hat person. So, okay. I have red hair. Most people have blonde, brown, or black hair. Some people color their hair in pink, blue, green, purple. Some people color their hair red. I have red hair since I was born. Coloring your hair red when you're older is not the same. Those people haven't been bullied or called names because of their red hair. Maybe they bullied red-headed kids themselves and were just jealous of the red hair. People that color their hair red don't have the temper that comes with being a ginger. That's why you got ginger snaps. They often say that people with red hair have no soul. My response seemed to, need, seemed to be frightening when I say that's why I eat yours. The other day, I saw a girl near the supermarket who had clearly had colored her hair red because it was done very well. And I wanted to go to her and ask, how does it feel to have no soul now? But I restrained myself. Sometimes when I laugh very loud, people ask me where it comes from. And I say from hell because people already think I have no soul. But it's also nice to have red hair. People come to you and say what wonderful color hair I have. It's a bit offensive if they ask if it's real. And there are the red hair days. All kinds of activities are organized just because you have red hair. Maybe that's also a nice thing that during those days, I don't stand out in the crowd so much because sometimes I do because of my red hair. Apparently, redheads have the superpower to produce their own vitamin D. It is said that only 2% of the population has red hair. So basically, I'm a majestic unicorn. Well, that was it. Oh yeah, I heard that the unicorn is a Scottish, um, um, what do you call it, Scottish um, national animal? It is indeed, yeah. Unicorns are national. No lions or eagles with us. We have the, the wonderful unicorn. <laughs> Thank you, Sophie. That was great. Yeah, I love oh, the red hair. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Love the red-headed poem as well. My wife's a redhead, so. <laughs> okay. Um, We've run out. Rich Davenport, uh, welcome. Thanks very much. Lovely to be a part of tonight. Thanks for giving me a spot. It's just been, I've been blown away by the amount of variety and different styles of poetry. So it's lovely to be part of it. Uh, I'm from Bolton originally. That's a place where four play means putting your kebab down. Um, I've been beavering away at poetry and stand up comedy on and off for about 19 years. Uh, I've had enforced breaks due to having ME, which I wouldn't recommend. Uh, last year, completely out of the blue, uh, I got my first book published uh, by Chimbia Books. So I'm donating a, a percentage of the proceeds from the book to the ME Association. Um, the book's called Gormless. It's a picture of a gnu on the front there. Uh, and I'll read you a couple of uh, 
selections of gibberish from that. One of these, uh, this first one's inspired by the Rolling Stones, who I think are the, the, the best example of growing old disgracefully. Uh, and it's combined with the, the notion of healthy eating. It's inspired by a Rolling Stones song title. It's called, It's Only Rock and Roughage, But I Like It. Now, after much in-depth analysis, it would appear to me that cabbage is the Keith Richards of the lettuce family. To support this theory further, eat them both, note your reaction. Lettuce alone won't fill you up, but cabbage gives you satisfaction. Lettuce is light and sprightly, while cabbage seems to stagger. That's cause cabbage is Keith Richards. And lettuce is Mick Jagger. Um, thank you. This next one's a, um, a, 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 a haiku. Haiku about GNU. It's a blue GNU. It's a blue GNU haiku. Blue GNU, moonlit zoo, plays his sax the whole night through. Chimps nod. They dig it. Uh, this next one um, is... Um, this is inspired by an ancient Scottish word, which was used by the great Scottish poet Robbie Burns. Uh, the word is Hochmagandi, which, which means sex. Um, and you've heard of Fifty Shades of Grey. This is Seven Shades of Hochmagandi, and it kind of helps to shout Hochmagandi at the end of every uh, every every verse. Right, Seven Shades. Number one, the bargain basement BG. Come and join me by the fireside, dear. Let's have a glass of brandy, and if the fancy takes you, there'll be time for Hochmagandi. Number two, there's life in the old dog yet. I'm 93 years old, and though my legs are bowed and bandy, with Viagra and a splint, I can still manage Hoch Magandhi. Number three, one sniff of the barmaid's apron. I can't take me drink. I lost me tits and half a shandy. He gives me brewer's droop, leaves me incapable of Hoch Magandhi. Number four, in every nook and cranny, if you get married on a nudist beach, you'll get all sandy. You'd better have a shower before attempting Hoch Magandhi. Number five, that Manilow magic. Barry Manilow sang songs about ladies with names like Mandy. Mandy was nice, but as for that woman in his 1981 at single Bermuda Triangle, oh, she was a wrong gun, buggered off with another man right in front of poor Barry and broke his heart, and all because she couldn't control her insatiable desire for Hoch Magandy. Number six, fringe benefits. Morgan Freeman was a chauffeur for Miss Daisy Jessica Tandy. She didn't pay his wage in cash, she paid in Hoch Magandy. Number seven, you'll have to get out of the habit. I have been a celibate monk for 50 years, but I'm still randy. Oh, bollocks to the monastery. It's time for Hoch Magandy. Now, one final word of warning. Chastity is fine and dandy, but the human race would be extinct if not for Hoch Magandy. Uh, this next one's called Young Elvis. In the early days of his career, young Elvis was given the nickname Elvis the Pelvis because of how he moved his hips on stage, not out of meanness. I bet he was relieved his parents didn't name him Enos. <laughs> uh, I, I love writing limericks. Uh, I apologise if this lowers the tone, um, but I'll throw a couple in. A confident nun down in Dorset went to church in a black leather corset, said the vicar, although I admire what's on shore, whilst on duty I cannot endorse it. A TV presenter called Paxman said, I've had a Brazilian wax man. He said, I look real fine with my bikini line. Ain't no hers in my crannies and cracks, man. Uh, a flamboyant young dandy from Datchet took out his John Thomas to scratch it. He said, I'm debonair with my green pubic hair, and he promptly proceeded to thatch it. Um, I'll leave you with, now with one uh, called uh, Three Meals with Roger. Don't stir the porridge with your penis. Don't use your dick to spread the jam. Oh, and don't put your charger in the sugar puffs. You've made an awful first impression on me, ma'am. Don't use your anus as an ashtray. Don't smear the ketchup in your crack. Oh, and don't poke a sausage up your sphincter. Oh, these friends of ours may not invite us back. Do you have to dip your gonads in the goulash? Must you bathe your bollocks in the broth? Oh, and now you've got your testes in the teapot. 
Well, I hope you scold the buggers. You've gone too far this time. I'm off. <laughs> Quite enough from me, thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Rich. Uh, that was great. Funny, great. Put a link in to, for your book on the chat if you want to make it, sure. That was great, Matt. I love about this space. You never know what you're going to get next. Well, actually, I do know what I'm going to get next now because it's Juanita. Oh, hello, everyone. Um, okay, so mine is, is a very different tone to to Rich. <laughs> Thanks, Rich. That was that was hilarious. Um, okay, I'm going to be um, sharing my screen, and uh, it's a multimedia piece. Um, so let me just do that. Um, okay. Um, and a little bit of context. Um, so I am from South Africa. My ancestors are from India. Um, this piece was uh, written on Friday. The melody in the video and the video itself is from about 10 years ago. Um, the video footage is from trips to India uh, between 2012 and 2016. This is for India and it's called Flames of the Funeral Pyres Torch the World. India. You are burning, burning your skin, burning your skin. I didn't want to love you. I wanted to despise you for bequeathing me a culture that feels as foreign as patriarchy and misogyny. Yes, also familiar and completely foreign in my fists of freedom. You were not even on my list. Why would I want to come to you when I knew that I would choose apartheid over your caste system on any God-given day? Choosing to be judged by race, not religion. India, you gave me skin I didn't want. Wishing for darker or paler, for black or white would not have placed me in the middle of racial or privilege in South Africa. With brothers and sisters who trusted me to journey their hearts and minds to spirit the source. You are magnificent, always awake. I am here today remembering your roads, your rivers, your where the sick are falling and the dead are burning. Why me? I am ashamed, guilty in my safety, so far away from you that you cannot touch me with your multitudinous sick, yet close enough to choke on every vaccine you make for I am sorry. I am sorry. I wish you could keep it and treat the world's vaccine production site as a place where people matter more than the service they provide. I know these are my words. Your grace, your humility, your compassion, your humanity rise above me. I am weak with my fears and judgment, my worries, my impatience. You are extraordinary. When my feet first touched your skin, I knew why I had avoided you. How do I ignore my heart now, knowing? It will one day 
About seeing the beauty of being moment, I yet can only encounter with my eyes, my heart, my mind. A surrender to life with all its unknowns, open to awe in any moment. Intoxicated by fragrant friendships, bubbling bliss, joy that sparkles. India, the lessons you teach are the lessons to be learned by us, by you, all of us falling here through the lies and deceit into the ocean of truth. India, I watch you burn, remembering you are in extinguishing. Thank you. I think I stopped my screen share, did I? Yes, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Anita. That was wonderful as always. Thank you. And uh, Rita is uh, our June headline feature sp spot. Can't remember the date, but uh, we know it. So <laughs> look, really looking forward to that. Thank you very much indeed. Okay. Uh, Moving on now, Becky. Hi, Glenn. Hi, everyone. Well, there's, it's sort of whipping up a storm here, so I hope you can hear me okay. Um, I've got two little, well, two poems for you today, short one and a long one. The first one's a parody, but it's a parody of uh, To Lucaster Going to the Wars by Richard Lovelace, written in the 1600s. So if you don't know the poem, it's not funny at all. Um, I'm going to try and paste it in the chat just in case it works. Oh, there you go. So there's the original. And here's my parody, which is a bit silly. So, um, here goes. It's just it's called To My Children Going to Work. Tell me not, child, I am unkind, that from this stirring place of love and chaos intertwined, I leave for my workplace. Through many deadlines now I chase so I might earn my pay, that with your needs I may keep pace for food, for clothes, for play. Yet though my absence you bemoan, you would not have us poor. Though much I long to stay at home, we need the money more. Was my silly little parody, sorry. <laughs> um, and this poem is called Old Anger. I don't know why I decided to do this. This is a poem I would never put in print because it's a bit vicious. It's entirely true, I'm afraid, sorry. Uh, trigger warning for um, a mention of self-harm. Um, and anyone that knew me could work out who it was about, so I don't put it out there just today. I felt like doing it. It seemed a shame to waste some good rhymes. So. Here goes. It's called Old Anger. I didn't know I was still angry till the day I heard you died. Suddenly the old bitterness is welling up inside. I haven't given you a thought for literally years. But now I find my eyes are filling up with tears, not of grief, but of reawakened pain, reliving the sting of your words all over again. I'm not the type of person to speak ill of the dead. I guess I'll add it to the self-approaches in my head. I thought I'd left behind the arrogance of youth that always lay the blame elsewhere and won't accept the truth. Thought I'd forgiven and forgotten and moved on with my life, but here I am, old anger burning, old pain cuts like a knife. As I read the tributes to the great man you were for sure, I can't help wondering if perhaps there are more like me who came for guidance and confidence and trust. You had your help and guidance in turning dreams to dust. I know you meant well. You were trying to tell me I'd never be the thing that I'd worked so hard to be since I was seven years old. 
Clearly not hard enough. I'm not tough enough, not made of the right stuff. Funny, that's not what you said four years before in my entrance test when you actually paid me money to choose your school above the rest. But I let you down, things went astray, took on too much, I lost my way, I knew I had more to give and I was ready to do so. I thought I'd get another chance. But that day, you said no. If you told me I lacked the technical skill, the physical strength or the mental will to do what it ta takes to reach great heights, I'd have to admit, time has proved you right. But what you actually said was so painfully wrong, it still hurts now, even after so long. I can't forgive how, in my postgrad audition, you turned me down by saying, you're too cheerful to be a musician. It could have been quite funny if it wasn't then so untrue. You told a girl who was sick and hurt that she was too happy to make it through. It was an insult to an injury that even now won't heal. You didn't tell me I couldn't play well. You told me I couldn't feel. I can now thank myself that I found the strength within to resist the urge back then to carve the pain into my skin or even go as far as the ultimate sacrifice to make you eat your words and pay the highest price. But still, nor did I fight despite you to succeed, to show I can bear my soul and musically let it bleed. Instead, I took the coward's way out and gave up on all my goals. Let life take me where it would. I let go of the controls. But hey, now I finally got all that off my chest, I can perhaps accept things really worked out for the best. Your peculiar judgment, voiced so thoughtlessly, through no fault of yours, became a self-fulfilling prophecy. True, I'm not a musician. Perhaps I was never meant to be. But I can say I'm often cheerful, and that's good enough for me. Thank you. Thanks, Finn. Thank you, thank you, Becky. Thank you. Hope you weather that storm as well as everything else. Yeah, it didn't interfere. Thank you very much. Okay, um, it's that time again. It's Jamie time. Oh, hello. Hiya. Um, one second. I'll get the cart off my lap. <laughs> Just, just no, just a minute. Um, right, well, I, can I just say, Becky, I really uh, related to that as somebody who didn't make it through their entire course. I had to drop out after the first year because I had a mental breakdown due to the pressure of it all um, placed on, on myself and I thought by my parents and what have you. So, um, and a... Uh, Maybe I'm not feeling enough because tonight I'm not going to do my usual kind of like slow soul searchy type stuff. I'm going to do a cheerful number. Um, does that sound loud enough? Hi. Okay, cool. I'll switch the headphones over now. I'm not going to be able to hear anything. Okay. Who can you rely on? Who's been there through the years? Who's always exactly right where you're at to share? Who's already at the center of the universe? Did you find myself? 
Yeah, thank you. I think I lie down now, Jimmy. Thank you. <laughs> that was fabulous, fabulous as always. Thank you. I'm surprised your voice held up two in one night. Huh? I've got another gig after this, have you? <laughs> All right, thank you. Love it, Jamie. Been along. All right. Uh, different person of Francesca. Hello. How's everybody? Hello. <laughs> you can hear me, right? Because yeah, I have my little fine. thing turned on. Yeah, yeah, you're fine. Yeah. Well, it's been a, a wonderful, rainy Nashville day here, especially hearing. Jamie there take us pretty much home with all the beautiful music I miss that music so much and it always makes me happy to hear people who have voices do music and collaborate together and see everybody that's the main thing is to see people 
and know that they, some of them have been through a lot and they are mothers, some of them today, of course, in America. And no matter whether they were a mother or a father or a sister or a brother, sometimes you have to take care of children that are born to other mothers. And that's a beautiful thing. And sometimes you have to take care of your own. And that's a beautiful thing. And sometimes they have to be adopted. And that's also a beautiful thing. So I just want to remind everybody to just respect who took care of you, even if you don't really feel a closeness to them because they did their best and they gave you life. And that's just one big, beautiful thing that we all have to come from. And even if there's misunderstandings in love, we know that we are all in this together, even mothering other people that didn't get that um, trait. So I just want to say thank you for that. And everything that I've heard today has been just wonderful from everyone, um, especially India. I, I really am sending positive thoughts toward India because I have friends there and I know how right now, like they're talking about how India is burning. And of course it's because of people and some people may close their minds and think, hmm, but I know as poets aren't doing that. We are, we are all in this again, um, doing the best we can to be supportive if we can. So if you can support someone's book, someone's, um, thing um finn and i know well, we've known each other for probably at least a year now and i know that you guys do your best also to support finn because finn is out there and he's not just a father a grandfather a great grandfather but he he drives this he drives us he he makes us all appreciate being together and that's one big gift that we can all give each other is a hug. Even if we can't hug each other, just say, look, you know, I'd be there for you if you needed me. So Finn, if you ever need anything, please, if I can do anything, just let me know. Anyway, um, just those words today from me, because like I said, you know, I've got a lot going on here, more stories later, but it's been a beautiful rainy day here and even though some people don't like rain they're like go away rain but i think you know it's it's another thing it's another thing that brings life because the water supplies nutrients to our plants and our food and the way that we live so if people can start enjoying life just one little bit every day and give that a positive go that's what's important you guys are important Keep writing, keep doing the best, best job that comes from you because that's what you make it and you make it there for me. Thanks. Hugs to all of you guys. Bye-bye from Nashville, Tennessee. Oh, thank you, Francesca, for your kind words as always. You're wonderful. It's been great having you around here this past year, working with me and and sponsor me, my film. Thank you. <laughs> You're a wonderful person. Thank you very much indeed. Okay. Um, Margaret, you're up now, please. Okay. Thanks, Finn. Um, it's pity Rich has had to leave early because this is um, the same topic. Um, and I love his hum humor, the humorous way he, he was. Um, writing about sex was just, it was great. There was laughing throughout. Anyway, this one is called Passion. Stirrings begin in my mind. Passionate thoughts run wild. Sensual sensations of you. The feel of you. The scent of you. The taste of you. The heat of you. Feelings flood my senses. Every muscle tenses, blushes, bring hot, blo hot blooded blushes, through every pore it rushes. Red hot desire quickens, exciting turn on visions, pleasure zones exude, erotically charged fluids, 
and all this before you walk in the door. That's it. Except to say, be sexually active, good for your immune system, all age groups. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you. Yes, thank you. All right. Uh, Gerard, the stage is yours. Thank you. Um, your name's Gerald, not Gerard. And uh, <clears throat> I feel um, it's time to get theological at this time of night. And um, I, oh, I, I should, taps. I should, the trigger warning to this poem. It does involve forfeits, or as we call them, taps. This is called Creation Myth. On the first day, God made taps. And there was a red one and a blue one. So everyone knew which was which, and they had knobs that turned. And no one got burnt, and it was good. On the second day, God made taps again. And this time they pressed down, but usually they got stuck and you got water all over your trousers, which make you look like you'd weed yourself. And if you press the red one, you jumped up and it was not good. On the third day, God concentrated mainly on taps. He went for ones which turned and swiveled, one way for hot and one way for cold, with red and blue streaks that you had to interpret like the book of Revelation, and you had to pull the tap up for water to come out, which meant that by the time you'd fiddled with it for half an hour, the water that emerged was scalding, hot, and yet again you looked like you'd weed yourself, which was still not good. On the fourth day, God rectified the problem of pulling the taps up. Instead, you put your hand, hand underneath and swiped it across, and it started the water, or if you went too far, the hot air dryer, and God decided that it was a miracle, and so decided that it would not happen sometimes so that those fuckers who believed in Darwinism would have to admit that the tap they were swinging their hand under was not producing water, even though it was for everyone else. And the scientific method was a bunch of crap which only prayer could sort out. God, make this tap work before the soap runs right through my finger. I wouldn't have put it on if I'd known. And God was pleased in their repentance and the boiling water gushed out and they still looked like they'd wet themselves. And perhaps thought God, I should have stuck with how it was on the first day for it was still not good. And on the fifth day, God made some really cool taps which had a central brushed chrome column and two pipes going off one of which gave cold water and one hot, although neither was clearly labelled. And the bit at the centre of the tap you had to press or pull or turn, or no one knew what. So you had to have faith in God and pray to the tap angel. And despite the brushed chrome and the high-tech Silicon Valley coolness, whatever you did and wherever you stood, the fuckers covered you in scalding water, while the businessman stood next to you who is probably responsible for all the environmental damage in the world, knew perfectly well how to use them, and you wet yourself again. And the businessman smirks because he's a sales rep from Trump Tower or something. And outside, your wife rolls her eyes and isn't interested when you blame God he made the world, after all, in the first place, I mean. And by, by mid-afternoon, even the good Samaritan wishes he could find a restroom without new fangled taps and repents of helping his neighbour out of a bind. 
Then God made zebras because he found hanging round men's toilet people had started talking, which was also not good. And on the sixth day, God really mixing up and took the urinals out of men's toilet so that they'd think that they'd gone to the ladies even before they put soap on their hands. And the taps didn't work. And five minutes later, they still stood over the Dyson hand dryer trying to get their trousers properly dry before walking into the world. And it was so not good, it was an absolute shitstorm. But at least there were armadillos and nothing preyed on them because God had not had time to make lions. And on the seventh day, God rested. And when men went to the bathroom, the devil followed and told them, all this tap shit is doing your head in. A real man wouldn't bother. So they went outside and shook hands with their neighbor. And thus cholera was created and diarrhea. And all those things we wouldn't have if taps just worked like they fucking should do. And when God woke up, he wasn't happy. And he asked the man about his toilet habits. And he asked the snake if he'd encouraged him. And both shook their heads and looked down at their suede shoes with wee marks on them. And God had pity on them and was full of forgiveness and wrote the book of Genesis and blamed Eve for man's fall, which generally went down well, if it wasn't for the fact that every, every toilet I go into reminds me that God still hates me. <laughs> Bit theological, sorry about that. It's serious on that one. Thank you, Gerald. I love that one. I love that one. I heard it before. It's still really, really funny. I think I remember the last time, yeah, I can't remember if we did it the last time. I ended up on chat, a big, huge discussion for ages on the merits of TAP. So, <laughs> you never know. Anyway, thank you. Thanks again once more. And once more, it's time to welcome. I think the only person, maybe Michael's been to, the only person who's been to every block, Leslie Constable. Wow, is that true? That's wonderful. I think so, <laughs> I think so yeah. <laughs> I was a, a, a Girl Scout as a girl. <clears throat> and yeah, it's sort of that, <clears throat> that's sort of a characteristic of all that. Um, so yeah, I'm going to read two short ones and a longer one. And so the first one, um, it's about uh, even with dispute and sometimes fierce political dialogue, keeping the heart open so it and we can listen to one another. So this one is called, When I Speak Softly. When I speak to you and I speak softly, I have something to say. When you shout, if it gets to that point, that place, in that moment when you scream, the subtlety of meaning, what you mean to say is lost and cannot be recovered. When you shout, I cannot hear you. You hear the sweet whispers of the lover. You hear the dulcet sounds of your mother singing you the lullabies of her people, your people. You hear these, they register deep in your soul. We are made to only half listen to the harsh voice, to resist, to block, to not take into us, into the middle of our soft, soft bellies, the screams of another. So listen to me, my love, my friend, little child, my sister, or my brother. Listen to me when I speak to you softly, because this is love. My second poem is called um, Angels in Exile. And um, yeah, reason exiles the angels. Reason exists to make the angels cry. Before the veil of reason dropped upon us, the dark curtain of night dividing us from the light, 
was mystery, things undone, things not said, things forgotten, timeless dreams remembered. I remember. I am a little bird circling, beating at your chest hard, hard, sometimes to draw your blood to get your attention. Please soften to me. I am pliant. I am lovely. I circle crying. Please soften to me. The times are black. The times are hard. Little time for dreaming. And who is that with the voice that drones on and on? So I hold my ears to block the sound of it. I need the quiet. I knead the dough, I bake the bread, I am tireless even in my sleep. Baking the bread of my dreams, I hear no voices and sleep deeply. In these black times to save yourself, you must sleep without dreams and hear only the sound of the angel's wings beating in your ears like the sound of your mother's heart above you. You must guard against theft, the thief in the night, is waiting for you to sleep and to steal your dreams as he hides in the juniper's long shadows on nights the moon is full until you fall heavy and succumb to your sleep. He is not afraid and sleeps with the habit of rarefied per perfection, nothing to steal the obscure excess of want, the heavy pressure of nothing, the studied absence of desire, under the trees waiting for you to succumb to his nothingness. The angels high above see him and weep. He does not believe in the rigor of his reason, his reason mind, he does not believe. In my mind, in the night, I see him running from one shadow, a dark gumdrop, a sentinel, sentinel absent of light to another cast by the juniper. Through the day, I travel quiet, Careful that no one sees me, I remain hidden and not shining in the habit of the angels. During the day, how lovely I am in the mystery, with no one seeing me, tireless and full of good energy and cheer, I save all weeping for the night on the long way home. My mind is pliant and open and full, I weep with the angels. Magic is on the wing, a gentle whisper secret as the song of my mother's heart beating above me. Magic enters into our sleep and weaves its soft web in and through the jagged places that in the morning are soft and pliant. So my final one is called Ojibwa Prayer. Um, I was born in Ohio in the United States and um, historically that was the territory of the Chippewa and the, which I think later morphed into Ojibwa, but there were Algonquin and, and all those Midwestern um, nations. And I particularly honor the Ojibwa because of their, um, all their prayers, all their amazing, um, you know, their belief system is just amazing. So here it is. If you are ready to go, and go. I will not hold you here, not with my fear or with my love, my love for you. We are in the circle sitting together when the wind comes up, when the wind comes up out of nowhere and moves us so. What are we but what we forget? What are we but always small in the wind, holding together the center, there at the center of the universe as the wind reaches for us to take us elsewhere, somewhere else, taking us apart from each other, tearing us from each other when we are not ready. We are sim simply not ready to go, pulling and pulling us upward in the great spin, the great spin of chaos again and forever, but we simply sit and hold the wind together, hold it as ours, the wind that comes for us this time and cannot have us. If you are ready to go, then go. I will stay. That's all for me tonight. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you. Wonderful as always. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Better down the list. Uh, yeah, Vron, please welcome Vron McIntyre back. Thank you. Um, this is a three part poem. Um, I wrote the first part about two years ago, and I've been writing the rest ever since. Um, it started out as a poem about Scotland. We were asked to write a poem about Scotland in a writing group. 
And um, so I, I went down a bit of a rabbit hole of uh, sort of ancient geology. But my Scottish great grandfather wanted to be in there as well. So, uh, so he ended up in it in the end. So this is language of the living stones. Number one, geology. Here in shallow time, rocks stand still. But dive deeper and they come alive. Continents crash in slow motion displacing oceans, squashing seabed into mountains, rifting so new seas form, which widen, pushing lands apart, collecting together, breaking up, living stones, transforming. Way back before Scotland had a name, two continents collide, closing an ancient ocean, suturing north country to south. Then a rift opens in the west, leaving both behind and widens. Highlands wave goodbye to Appalachians, fossils sundered from their receding cousins, leaving a new land, a new landscape, inscribed with the deep scars of an old language. Two, mineralogy. And given time, the crafting, rifting rocks form mountains, lowlands, rivers, hot springs, locks, and water drips and pours, flows and gurgles, trickles through, dissolving minerals, carrying forward, laying down deposits. Rocks weather slowly, combine with water, forming clay. Sediment to be scraped and worked into the stuff of life. Shaped up by tectonics, by clash and grind, then by human hands. Feldspar, silicates, fine grains, plastic when wet. Flat flakes packed in layers like the pages of a closed book. Clay for tablets, the oldest writing that survived, inscribed with the fresh scars of a new alphabet re-encoding an old language, absorbing water, then drying hard, clay for fulling, for farming, for forming into vessels for daily living, stone worn down, formed, then transformed by fire into bricks or used for making paper, spreading languages further across the rift between people, between continents, between us. Three, genealogy. And here, Jock Livingston of Blantyre, known for singing and drinking, selling songs to music halls for pints of beer, going where the work was, down to the potteries, back to Norton, where my grandmother was born. Master Potter, taking substance from the land formed over millennia from water weathering rock, giving it new life, sweating in the kiln heat, working and wedging cool wet clay with skilled hands, shaping, suturing, Remaking the stone once more for a living, plates and cups by day, puzzle jugs by night when the pottery was closed so none would see the secrets of his craft. And after work, after a pint or two, he'd come home singing, bringing auction lots of old newspapers, bought and to the despair of Mary Ann, trying to feed two girls on next to nought. Talking politics, passion, justice, teaching his daughters to read from the newspapers, inscribed with the printed words, a modern language bridging the rifts, giving them ideas. He died before the war when my mother was small. Fifty odd years later, I receive a letter from my grandmother, his daughter, who's heard I'm taking pottery classes. She sends his clay shaping tool wrapped in notepaper. Treasure, talisman, tangible link to the past from across the deep widening rift in time between us the shaping the clay, forming, reforming, colliding and rifting, inscribing the world once again with the language of the living stones. Thanks for listening. Oh, thank you, Fran, thank you. An epic poem, just wonderful, <laughs> thank you. I love that, love that too. Okay, um, yeah, someone else, first time, first time plotter? Please welcome Philip. Oh, uh, I is it the first time? <laughs> I know everybody, <laughs> but we've met in so many different places. Thank you again, Finn. Um, yeah, um, I I've been doing a lot of music lately. I'm out performing again finally uh, after a, a long time. Yeah, the, uh, a week ago was the first time I could bring all of my musicians together and go out and play in 18 months. Um, so that was very nice. And uh, one of the things I've been doing is, of course, I've been writing. Uh, I tend to write a lot during the pandemic, 
and a lot of songs. And I'm kind of trying to look through decades of poems and figure out what I want to put into a big collection. And that and that's an on. So I'm kind of like looking at poems somewhere else and not reading them too much um, aloud. Uh, but in the process, I've been I've been exploring the roots of the Americana music that I play and write, and uh, you know the roots of it are jigs and reels and airs, um, English folk songs, Irish fiddle tunes, Scottish folk songs, that sort of thing. Um, so in the process of thinking about that, um, you start writing about it when you start thinking about it. And you start wondering about how it got to you. And this song that I want to do um, is sort of dedicated to my own history, my own family history. Way back in 1795, uh, the first Christopher, the first Henry Seaborn Christopher was born in Waterford County in Ireland. Uh, probably the descendant of someone that had to run away from England <laughs> to Ireland uh, after the assassination of Thomas a Becket. So there's a lot of history there. And then um, that person came to the New World and found another expat from Ireland, Olive Mahan, who was born in 1797 and comes from the ancient Irish clan that ruled Oriel, the area of Armagh, a very, very long time ago. They got married in, on August 22nd, 1822. Uh, their progeny ended up, uh, their son became my grandfather's grandfather. And uh, my grandfather had a brother named Will, who was the only musician that my, my own father could remember, who was Henry Seaborn Jr. of the 20th century, uh, could remember who played an instrument, and of course he played a fiddle. Um, so with a little creative license, I wrote a song thinking about how that music came all the way down from the British Isles to me <laughs> and, and the 300, two or three hundred year journey it took for all that music to get here. By the way, the banjo was first noted to have, occur have arrived in Ireland in about 1822, 1840, something like that. that we, of course, we now know is... is a, a, a standard in Irish trad music even so but anyway this one called uh, Grandpa's Fiddle How will he played his grandpa Grandpa's Fiddle that had come across the sea far away and he said it was his calling to remember each and every song his grandpa played oh he'd lift his bow each morning before sunrise as the dawn was breaking, he would play Songs floating on the mist down in the valley His melodies would hail the coming day William Donnelly has left the dance hall He's fiddling in that ballroom in the sky And I'm sure he's found that better home awaiting By and by, oh Lord, by and by Late one night, old Will, he came a-callin' He said, son, I'd be obliged if you'd come along 
There's some folks down yonder need to hear us playing They lost their ma and now they need our songs So we play some old time music on our fiddle we sang gospel songs to ease their heavy hearts. Amazing grace and will the circle be unbroken. Me and Will were glad to do our William Donnelly has left the dance hall He's fiddling in that ballroom in the sky And I'm sure he's found that better home awaiting By and by, oh Lord, by and by In the shadows of the morning, I will wander Out into the fields with fiddle and bow And play the airs and reels my grandpa taught me All the old time music that I know Cause I'm sure somehow old Will is up there listening He'll rosin up his bow to play along With all the Donnellys who went before him Gathering to join me in the song William Donnelly has left the dance hall He's fiddling in that ballroom in the sky And I'm sure he's found that better home awaiting By and by, oh Lord, by and by Yes, I'm sure he's found a better home awaiting By and by, oh Lord, by and by hmm. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Wow. And maybe if I maybe if I can get to uh, Athens, Greece next year, <clears throat> I can learn some repetitia music, and I can honor my Greek ancestry because that's the other half of my of my mixed up ancestry. Thank you so much. Yeah, your balalaika for that one. Then. <laughs> <laughs> well, I could always I could go halfway, just like between <laughs> Appalachia, you know, and Donegal is the music this song and halfway between greece and the united states is the irish bazooki <laughs> i could get one of those good mix there. good mix there. thanks anyway thanks for thank you thank uh, coming you. along us get a join so like thank you all right fly across way across the ocean now so yeah maggie hall <laughs> that hurt did it <laughs> Am I, um, can you hear me, Finn? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Oh, good. Philip, I just want to say thank you for washing away the hate and, and bringing in such a, a beautiful wistfulness in your music. I, oh. Yeah, I was, I was lying down and um, it, it, was, it was really, heart, yeah, the story, heartfelt and quite beautiful. So thank you for that. that, that I know it healed me from... 
before. Okay, I'm just going to read um, a few keeps because I said I just I'm so tired myself, so I don't want to read anything I've done. Um, hopefully, I do it justice and I don't mis mispronounce much. So this is um, keen, fitful gusts. Keen, fitful gusts are whispering here and there among the bushes half leafless and dry. The stars look very cold about the sky and I have many miles on foot to fare. Yet feel I little of the cool bleak air or of the dead leaves rustling drearily or of those silver lamps that burn on high or of the distance from home's pleasant lair. For I am brimful of the friendliness that in a little cottage I have found of fair-haired Milton's eloquent distress and all his love for gentle lysed ground, of lovely Laura in her light green dress and faithful Petriarch gloriously crowned. Um, okay, this one is Lines on the Mermaid Tavern. Souls of poets dead and gone, what Elysium have ye known? Happy field or mossy cavern, choicier than the mermaid tavern. Have ye tipple drink from vine that mine hosts canary wine, or are fruits of paradise sweeter than those dainty pies of venison, O oh, generous food, dressed as though bold Robin Hood would with his maid Marian sup and browse from horn and can. I have heard that on a day mine host's sign board flew away. Nobody knew whither till an astrologer's old quill to a sheepskin gave the story, said he saw you in your glory. Underneath a new old sign, sipping beverage uh, divine and pledging with contented smack the mermaid in the zodiac. Souls of poets dead and gone, what Elysium have ye known? Happy field or mossy cavern, choicier than the mermaid tavern. And the last one I'm going to read is Ode. Bards of passion and of mirth. Bards of passion and of mirth, ye have left your souls on earth. Have ye souls in heaven too? double lived in regions new, yes, and those of heaven commune with the spheres of sun and moon, with the noise of fountains, one dross, and the parley of voices, thundross, with the whisper of heaven's trees, and one another in soft ease, seated on Elysian lawns, browsed by none but Deanne's thorns. Fawns underneath large bluebells tented where the daisies are rose scented and the rose herself has got perfume which on earth is not. Where the nightingale doth sing, not a senseless trance thing, but divine melodious truth, philosophic numbers, smooth tales and golden histories of heaven and its mysteries. Thus ye live on high and then on the earth ye live again. And the souls ye left behind, you teach us here the way to find you. Were ya other souls are joying, never slumbered, never cloying. Here your earthborn souls still speak to mortals of their little weak, of their sorrows and delights, of their passions and their spites, of their glory and their shame, what does strengthen and what maim. Thus ye teach us every day wisdom through, fled far away. Though bards of passion and of mirth, ye have left your souls on earth. Ye have souls in heavens too, double lived in regions new. Okay, so <laughs> thank you. Thank you for having me, Finn. Yeah, thank you, Maggie. Hope your back gets better soon. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> thank Always you. Okay, <laughs> it's never too late in the day for a debut. <laughs> I'm blocked.
It's been around. We've seen it before. So please welcome Jody Lee. Thank you. Hello. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, thank you for hosting this rather cosmopolitan digital arena. It's been brilliant. And we kind of whittled down to the, the hardcore elements now, I think. Everyone tends to be leaving. Um, I, I want to do like a brand new poem, a bit of a scratch test, I think. I've never performed it before. Um, I do a lot of work in recovery, mental health and things like that, working with people. And I'm in recovery myself as well. And I actually, I had a lapse about three months ago. It's tough, you know, it's been really, really tough times for a lot of people. And I wrote this poem about, I think anyone who's been in recovery and knows people who are in recovery knows that the path out of it is never clear. Lapses are a part of it. Um, so yeah, I sort of wrote this about the journey of the lapse and coming, coming back to myself. It's called Create Not Consume. I lapsed again, relaxed my straps and collapsed again and it hurt. I fell fast, fell far, I hit the floor hard and when I looked around, it was already dark. I had been swallowed, swallowed, swallowed whole. I consume, not create. I consume, not create. I consume, not create my self-hatred states. Is this all I can do? I feel stuck. I've been here before. I've been in this dark dust bowl, forgotten friends. Oh, sorry. Um, stuck in this dark bus bowl, forgotten friends far away, sing, saying come back or turning their backs. And both actions hurt. I did not mean to lose control. I did not mean to let you down. I did not mean to end up here again, but I did. And I know this place. I know it's dark. I know this space. I know it's hard. I know this place, but I also know that there are paths. And if I just reach out, I know that there are arms and I can climb. It will require strength. It may take all that I have left, but it will be strength well spent. See, I can climb up and create a path create a light, create my spark. I can create, not consume. I can create, not consume. I can create, not consume. And if I can create joy from this devil's hell, then I can create anything. I can do anything. I can achieve anything. I could discover the God particle, for I know dark matter intimately. I could gain access to the unified field, for I have been the empty unmanifest. I could understand Twin Peaks. Hell, I could understand any David Lynch movie and maintain my sanity. I could converge the elegant nuances of T.S. Eliot. Eli Elliot and the mad ramblings of William Burroughs and create a piece so wondrous that all who read it would want to create, not consume. Create, not consume. Create, not consume. I can create. For out of my consumption, I created this. Thank you. Um, I'd like to do another one. I've got a couple more. One a little bit longer and a short one at the end. This one's a bit different because not all my poems are about recovery. Though a lot of them are, obviously. It's been a big part. Nothing like addiction gives you a, it gives you a hell of a backlog of poetry addiction does, weirdly. It's not a lot else to do when you're sitting around just taking lots of drugs all the time. Um, this one's more about nostalgia. And I grew up in the 80s. But I think this applies to anybody who grew up pre-technology. Uh, this is called Growing Pains. When I was a kid, I know I did some really stupid stuff. I built traps, did tricks, threw stones and sticks and tried to blow stuff up. I pushed my luck and luck pushed back and sometimes I got hurt. And even when I wasn't hurt, I was face down in the dirt. But that was all a part of growing up, a ritual of age to pull some stupid, crazy stunt and live to walk away. We would gather in our girl shy groups, all scuffed knees and grass stains and see who could dream up the stunt of stunts, the one to end all days. Well, I say end all days, but it was fun and games, a part of boisterous play. We could bounce about like rubber balls and fall from trees all day. And sometimes we did. 
We hid in derelict ruins and climbed their crumbling walls. We would cling to trees on windy days and swing them to and fro and fall. Yes, we'd fall and laugh and cheer, then climb right up again. It's like I didn't have a sense of fear in my not fully formed yet brain. That part allegedly came later. We would chase wild snakes, skate frozen lakes, ride bikes down woodland hills. Cuts and bruises, sprains and breaks were the currency of thrills. No pills to face the pain I racked, no fear of what could be, just my stupid mates and stupid me being stupid young and free. Oh, what fun we had all blue and black, crashing bikes in tangled heaps, catching frowns and scowls from the village girls as they held their tea parties. No, not for me. No tea, thanks, Ted. I've got a date with that there ramp. I've got to test the integrity of my head, see if I can make my memory stamp. Then with a thump, I'll take a lump and be lights out like a lamp. Be on the ground making walrus sounds while my mates will chant the champ. Those wild days, those painful days, those free live days have passed. I can't go out in public now covered in dirt and blood and grass. But that's OK. I paved the way for much stupidity. See, I had two brothers in my wake who were stupid two and three. I had a sister too, so I know it's true that girls are just more smart because she wouldn't partake in our harebrained schemes if she knew that they hurt from the start. And I look back now with fond memories and amazed that I survived. I mean, I do have scars on my head, my arms, my chest and my hands and my thigh. See, when I was a kid, I definitely did some really stupid stuff. But the stupidest thing that I ever did as a kid, well, that was grow up. Thank you. Um, have we got time to do one more short one? Yeah, of course. OK, so. this one, I wrote this about a year ago and I have not got tired of performing it. I love it and it's really fitting for the time. It's kind of to do with um, not judging people really and thinking about what might be going on for other people. This is called Humans Being. For some people, it is difficult simply to exist. For some people getting through the day is like working a double shift without a manager, without staff, without any support at all. Some people feel all alone stood in a bustling mall. Some people feel they need to scream but cannot find their voice. Some people choose to be strong each day when they never had a choice. Some people hide their feelings with a smile on their lips because some people taught them a stiff upper lip is the way some people live. Some people long to ask for help, but can't even hold your eye. And some people put on a grown-up show while inside their child hides, frightened, confused, and alone. They've never known how to fill their space despite how much they've grown. Some people cage their heart away when they long to set it free. And some people risk their heart each day and pin it to their sleeves. Some people open up their hearts and live their life to serve. And some people see them as easy marks and not as they deserve. Because some people think that greed is needed to get themselves ahead. They carve a path through kinder hearts, not caring where they tread. Some people count their blessing while dressing in the dirt. And some people medicate their minds when stressing makes it hurt to think, hurt to talk, hurt to be. See, we can rant and shout and scream, but we only need to breathe. Some try their best in every test and still feel lost at sea. And some people struggle and get called a mess because that's all some people see. But in truth, all of these people, they are just people like you and me. See, some people, it amounts to us. Good or bad, we're just humans being. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jody. Thank you very much. That was great. Thank you. I remember I said to my wife years ago, oh, God, people are stupid. And she says, you can't say that. And then one day <laughs> something happened and she says, yeah, I see what you mean now. Right? <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of evidence. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Especially in my job as a taxi driver, it's like all the time, you know, all the time. Right. Okay, moving on. Three, go. Gary, <laughs> Gary's needing a shower, so Gary asks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, thanks, Finn. I've just 
great show. Um, some of you know that I, I haven't been around just lately, but I've got a couple of features. I'm even going to do a Clive, Clive Oseman slam soon. Um, so, and, and, and I've just come from work. I started watching the, the show with Finn reading something. Um, I, was in, I was in the bathroom at work um, hiding to make sure <laughs> that I didn't get cut for any more jobs. And then I've <laughs> listened to a great show since and listened to people in Levi's, but I'm at home now. Um, this, the, the two poems, I was looking to sort of like, no, it's not about the, the people I'm going to dedicate to, um, but some of you know that I've been really busy, but also the as well as India, but the island where my family are from, and I've got a lot of family on St. Vincent, is um, in a period of desperate need as well. They're in, uh, there's a hurricane just gone off the of um, It's been, it's not been widely reported. That's the BBC for you, the idea being news. Um, but so it has been a, been a lot of stress, stressful time. Um, and where I've, daily I'm listening to family, um, listening to family in, in, in the island of St. Vincent showing me videos and how they can't, you now there's a pandemic going on in, in there, but they've got no water, they've got no nothing. And so that's been hard. But there's three, three people I'd just like to thank because I know I've just been feeling really shit lately. Um, one is Kathy Carson, who, who texts me daily to, just to make sure, <laughs> make sure I'm still breathing. And I said I wasn't going to come back, do any more poetry till Clive Owens' event. The other is Leslie Constable because she's just gorgeous. Huh? And finally, the person I would just like to thank and dedicate these three poems to is Francesca because she's just pure beauty, beauty personified. And uh, even though these poems don't reflect it, it's just like, I'm pretty sure I wouldn't be reading these poems. And it's been really stressful. This first one, as I, as I drove home tonight, as a new all 24 seven hour garage. And it sells those flowers. You know those flowers. Those, those those flowers when you not to get the anniversary where you just want to like <laughs> you want to stay up late and watch the footy. It, those flowers, which are like you know you pretend you know you have forgotten everything about your wife's anniversary, but you just got those flowers from the garage, the four court flowers. As I came, as I, as, I, as I drove home tonight, I listened to all you guys, it came over the news that two people this weekend had died in my hometown in Peterborough of being stabbed. One was nine years old. So this goes on. Four court flowers. Question, all of you, what's still awake? What came first? The black and yellow tape? Please, incident, stay away. All the four flowers where a dead brother lay. What came first? What came first? A fly post and a lamppost of a missing tomcat or a post of a poster of a teenager in his school uniform who was found with his face down flat. What came first? Common sense. Common sense. We're British. We have common sense. What came first to call for a knife, Amberstee? Or the white chalk lines of a blood victim being washed away? What comes first? A mother's fear? Or when a mother can't shed any more tears? What came first? And a final question for you guys. As I pulled up to that 24-7 garage. What come first? You know what? The chicken or the egg? Do you know what? Who cares? I'm staying at this night garage to buy some more flowers before they wilt and die. Oh, 
and I've got a slightly not more cheery one of that uh, have to follow. Um, in this self-posed isolation from Zoom, uh, I've now broke. <laughs> I'm so, sorry, psychologist. Cost me 150 quid lying down saying I will I am not addicted to Zoom. I've wrote loads. I've got I've got four features coming up soon. I've got four features coming up soon. And I have wrote some really good stuff, guys. You don't want to miss them. But this, this is one of my favourites, but it's not going to be the same. This takes me back to 1963. No, I wasn't that born because with these beautiful looks. When four little girls, one, two, three, four, four little girls were killed while at a Bible school. Four little girls, not little, little, L-I-C-K-L-E, September morning, 63. No, it wasn't Four Seasons. In a quiet Baptist church on 16th church, four little children, one, two, three, four, four little girls, reading the good news in Bible class, hooding men through dynamite through the stained glass. 58 years late, the stained glass window still remains stained with the blood of one, two, three, four little girls. Four little girls lost their lives. Little Dee McNee was only nine years old. Carol played the clarinet in the school shows. Cynthia was her mama's only child and as for Adley May had just enrolled in junior high when the KKK sent four little girls sky high. Four little girls little lost their lives. So many have lost in the tide of violence against civil rights Never forget or forgive the soul of a nation, cried four little girls. Four little girls lost their lives. A prayer for four little girls. A prayer for you. And a prayer for I. Could four little angels painted in the stained glass window, pointing where girls fly. Four little girls, four little girls lost their lives. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Thank you. Wonderful stuff. Thank you very well. I love that one. I love them both. I love that last one too. Very sad. Very too. All right. A final trip abroad. It's kind of Jeff Cottrell. Okay, so here's uh, at least our seven, our second uh, silly uh, poetry parody of the day. This is a uh, pattern after uh, William Carlos Williams. It's called "This Is Also to Say." This is also to say. I have also eaten the leftover pizza that was beside the plums and which you were going to microwave for lunch tomorrow. It was a bit stale, but I ate it anyway and washed it down with two of your Stella's. I also cooked and ate the white chickens beside that rain glazed barrow that your upcoming family feast was probably depending upon. And I stomped on all those greeny flowers in your garden for the hell of it. And I fucked your wife. She was incredible, so sweet and so hot, I regret nothing. She screamed in twisted ecstasy. And then we laughed about your shortcomings. Now she wants to leave you, move in with me and bear my kids. She will sue you for your house, half your money, and full custody of Brad. By the way, Brad hates you too. He thinks you are the dullest daddy. I will take him to Disneyland 
and then buy him a puppy. I have the money to do that, and you do not. So tough shit. This is also to say, I have written another parody of Carlos Williams. I tried to match his formatting, but probably did a lousy job. Forgive me, I was uninspired, so lazy, and so cheap. So that was my first one. This is also to say, and my second one, I'm going to do a, a special cover. Uh, as some of you know, it's Mother's Day in North America. So uh, I'm going to do a cover poem for Mother's Day. Uh, there it is. This is uh, by a, a British poet uh, called Andy Summers. I think some of you might know him better as the guitarist for a little band called The Police. And this is his poem called Mother. <clears throat> well, the telephone is ringing. Is that my mother on the phone? Telephone is ringing. Is that my mother on the phone? The telephone is screaming. Won't she leave me alone? The telephone is ringing. Is that my mother on the phone? Ah! Ah! Well, every girl that I go out with becomes my mother in the end. Every girl I go out with becomes my mother in the end. Well, I hear my mother calling, but I don't need her as a friend. Well, every girl I go out with becomes my mother in the end. Oh, oh, mother. Oh, mother dear, please listen and don't devour me. Oh, mother dear, please listen. Don't devour me. Oh, woman, please have mercy. Let this poor boy be. Oh, mother dear, please listen. Listen, and don't devour me. Oh, mother. Well, the telephone is ringing. Is that my mother on the phone? Telephone is ringing. Is that my mother on the phone? The telephone is screaming. Won't she leave me alone? The telephone is ringing. Is that my mother on the phone? Oh, <laughs> mother. So that was my sweet little Mother's Day poem by Andy Summers. I think it would help if I muted myself, would it? I'm speaking to myself here. So, Professor, thanks, Jeff. Thank you very much indeed. I went out our very, very last uh, spot tonight, as it usually is. <laughs> Clive Osman. Hello. I've got to follow Jeff with this rubbish. Bloody hell. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, as they say, you know, for something completely different. This will either work or it won't. I don't know. Um, so, here we go. Hello. My name is Auntie Ethel's pet rabbit. It used to be just Auntie Ethel's rabbit. But for some reason, people used to snigger at the thought of Auntie Ethel having a rabbit. I don't understand why, but was told it was personal. I'm not sure what my real name is. I never knew my dad, and unusually for a rabbit, my mother couldn't talk. All I know is, I'm a bastard rabbit. I'm doing a very poor impersonation of a duck because, well, I can, so why not? I'm not sure impersonating is the right word for a duck, though. It's not a person, is it? Never mind. I'm being paid lots of lettuce to introduce Clive Oseman's latest so-called poem which is apparently called Don't Tell Me How to Write Poetry Cos I'm Off My Rocker. He claims the aim is to combine the poetic mastery of Shakespeare with the comic genius of a Robert Garnham on acid. Let me tell you, he's failed miserably on both counts. But humour him. Laugh in all the right places, if you can work out what the right places are. It's not always easy. 
He is a sensitive soul and has the temper of a ginger bow end. Rabbit pie is a terrible end if you catch my drift. Okay, enjoy. And please, 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 laugh. <laughs> Listen, I don't know what you're expecting tonight, but you know my head is not quite right and I'm going to write a load of shite. But if you tell me that, get ready to fight, because I'm a vicious bastard when I lose it. They suggested anger management, but I refused it. Anyway, that's full of rhyme and that. And we all know rhyme is a bit old hat, even the cat. Modern audiences like something more sophisticated, with the meaning disguised and pixelated. Straightforward expression asphyxiated. Oh, bollocks. I can't help myself, can I? I really do try, but... Ah, I did it again, as, as Brittany almost said way back then. Stop it! Stop it, you moron! Stop rhyming! And write something obscure. You can do it for sure. Oh, for fuck's sake. There must be a cure. A slap in the face? Yeah, that might work. The moon rotates like a hippo in the washing machine on a 30 degree cycle. I hope he doesn't shrink. I've only got the one. Pink carnations spring down his nostrils like shafts of light in a dark, dank basement. The alluring aroma of coffee drifts into the far corners of the universe, reviving the stars as they begin to droop like a drunkard's todger. What? You're all misunderstanding this. The meaning is deeper than the Marks and Spencer's luxury mince pie with the bottom cut out, like the tongues of mine enemies. It's there if you look for it, like God and bedbugs. I bet you wish I'd stuck to rhyme, eh? I knew you would somewhere, even though it's pretty low, bro. Ciao. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Clive. What a way to finish the evening. What a way to finish your week. You know, not only slam winner, raffle winner, and you now closing like a block from the blue on a Sunday night. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you all. Thank you all. It's been another, actually, looking at a record breaking when we've got 20, 20 minutes longer than we've ever done before. Wow, great stuff. Thank you all. I can only thank you all for coming. We know the ones that stuck from the beginning ones that couldn't come in at the beginning i get you and it's a long night but i still think it's a fun night and thank you all for sticking with me and being here sunday nights wouldn't be the same by the way next week it won't be <laughs> i'll see you all and i'm actually doing my first uh zoom headline thing tomorrow at soundbite so i don't have the link so you want to call me off to find it yourself sorry but i'm doing that tomorrow night i haven't got the link through myself yet so i don't know thank you all it's um, been fun yeah. and thanks to all the new blotters tonight that'd be great wonderful as always thank you finn thanks finn thanks everyone even though there were who couldn't join at the beginning. Yeah. Oh, that's okay. Because we were at that's what I like about this one. We were at Ransible Spoon listening to Jeff Cottrell doing good stuff. And Skylar too. Skylar was good too. Wasn't Jamie there too? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. We, we, it's, it's not that long a train trip, honestly. From... <laughs> but the thing is, yeah, Skylar was good, but she didn't hear and she didn't get to send me bucket loads of money like you are, Jeff. <laughs> that's right. It's, that's what the that's what the blanket is. It's just money. It's just money disguised as a blanket. Now Kathleen keeps sending me, but we keep. I'm going to have to check with with uh, with her and with uh, grassroots because they start with we never conflicted. But this past few times, we've all been in the same night, you know. And I really ought to get back to uh, Runcible Spoon, if only the fact that. Uh, 
they're putting up my book, so I think I'm going to have to go there and, and, and be nice to them, you know. <laughs> it, do, it doesn't overlap very much, Finn. What was that? It, do, it wasn't a huge overlap. No, no, it, it's not for people coming and going, but it's for me actually going to it and then having to come and get my own one done. I couldn't do that, you know, because this is a, it's a long shift in this. It's a pleasurable shift, but it's a, it's a long shift to do this, you know. Yeah, Leslie's rubbing her eyes. That's exactly what it's like. <laughs> it's fine, but I'm going to have to go. I haven't seen my wife for about four and a half hours, so. Thank you all. See you all soon. Next yeah, one's on the third. Yeah. Next one's on the thirtieth of May. Another open mic. I'll get that sorted soon, and I'll get all the new blotters put onto the collage. Bye. Thanks. Bye, Jimmy and his pussy cat. <laughs> <laughs> Bye.